It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. We have a great panel for you. Anthony Ha is here. You may remember his byline from TechCrunch. I certainly do. He's got his own podcast now. He writes for a lot of publications. Our car guy, Sam Abul Samad, is here. We'll talk about Elon Musk. He's suing OpenAI, saying, hey, that's not what you, <laughs> you said you'd be doing. We'll also talk a little bit about cars. It seems like Apple's getting out of the car business. Were they ever in it? And all the music is leaving TikTok. Where does that leave the musicians? Where does that leave the talkers? All that and more coming up next on Twit. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is, is Twit. Twit. This is Twit. This Week in Tech. Episode 969, recorded Sunday, March 3rd, 2024. Chasing Shadows in the Digital Abyss. This episode of This Week in Tech is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Going online without ExpressVPN, eh, that's like using your smartphone without a case. Most of the time, yeah, you'll be fine. But all it takes is one drop to make you wish you'd protected yourself. Why does everyone need a VPN? Well, first of all, unfortunately, it doesn't take much technical knowledge to hack someone. Just some cheap hardware. And look, your data, your privacy, your information is valuable. Hackers can make like $1,000 a person selling personal info on the dark web. So every time you connect to an unencrypted network, whether it's a cafe, a hotel, an airplane, your online data is not secure. Now, that's why I say use ExpressVPN. It's certainly what I use. It's super secure, has an encrypted tunnel between your device and the Internet, so no bad guy on the plane, in the hotel, in the cafe can see anything but just nonsense going by. It's very easy to use. It works on everything you've got, iPhone, Android, Mac, OS, uh, Windows, Linux. It even works on, on smart TVs and, and routers. You just fire up the app, you click one button, and then you're protected. You can also use the app to go to travel, shall we say, to other areas where the shows you want to see are still available. Hint, hint. I love ExpressVPN. I trust it, and I encourage you to try it. Secure your online data today by visiting expressvpn.com slash twit. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash twit. You'll get an extra three months free with a one-year package. That's your best deal. ExpressVPN.com slash twit. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show we cover the week's tech news. And we're going to do it with some really great guys. First time he's been on Twit, he's been on uh, Twit. Actually, first time on Twit with me. He's been on Twit before. You remember him with Devendra. Uh, Anthony is high is here. I know Anthony from his byline for years on TechCrunch. He's a freelancer now and does the original content podcast. Anthony, welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be I'm, on real twit for the first time. This is the big boy twit. Jeff That's Jarvis right. Jeff Jarvis calls it the grown up table. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm <laughs> thrilled to have you on. I love your work. And we have lots to talk about. Also with us, our car guy, Sam Abul Samad. He's a principal research at Guidehouse Insights, but he's also the host of the Wheel Bearings podcast at wheelbearings.media. Hello, Sam. How are you? I'm good, Sam. Great to see I, you. I, I just realized my shirt is semi translucent right now because I'm, oh. I'm in front of a green screen and. Oh. Sort of a blue green shirt. It's then, weird. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, he's like a little ghost boy. <laughs> Casper, the, the friendly abyss, but Bull Salmon. Uh, good to see you both. Lots to talk about, but I'm very glad you're here, Sam, because uh, it was a bit of a shocker this week. Apple can canceled a product it never announced. And uh, as well, far as being a shock to you, <laughs> as far as anybody knows, it was all imaginary. It was just a dream for the last 10 years. Project Titan, widely rumored to be Apple's uh, car project. Mark Gurman, who's very reliable, uh, said that on a Tuesday, the memo went out that we are canceling the project. We're going to try to move everybody uh, from Project Titan over to our AI efforts. But the Apple car is unofficially dead because it never lived you said you're not surprised no uh i mean when first reports of project titan first came out in early 2015 
Um, I I had written I wrote a series of articles on my personal blog back then, basically uh, indicating my skepticism that Apple would ever follow through and actually build a car. Uh, having spent the last thirty plus years in the auto industry, I you know it, it never seemed probable that they would actually do this because you know Apple, as we know, is a company that generally only likes to go into market segments where they can make really large profit margins, like 35 plus percent profit margins. And pretty much nobody in the auto industry comes even close to that kind of profit margin. Um, and, and so it just, it never really made sense that Apple would do this. Um, you know, I figured, you know, they would play around with it for several years, um, try some things. I did, you know, at the time, you know, lay out a few scenarios where that could be possible scenarios for them because among the other things they had been doing at the time was they had invested a billion dollars in Didi, which is a Chinese ride hailing company, similar to Uber and Lyft. D I D I D D. Yes. And they were also, uh, you know, doing a bunch of other things. They had, uh, purchased the company, uh, forget the name of it now, but it was the company that developed the original Microsoft connect, it was an Israeli company. Oh yeah, uh, which had some really interesting sensing and perception technology. Um, you know, and what you know, what I figured that if it one one potential scenario that could work for Apple would be if they could um, do a premium mobility service um, rather than selling cars, because again, one of the, the challenges for for Apple is they like to control their entire ecosystem. And, you know, once you sell a vehicle to consumers, you lose control of that. You can't control, for example, what tires they put on it, what parts they might replace over the life of that vehicle, um, what other modifications they might make. But if they had done something like a, uh, a subscription uh, robo taxi service, you know, a premium subscription robo taxi service, then, you know, they could retain control of those vehicles. They can ensure that nothing gets modified. Um, they don't have to deal with, for example, setting up a dealer network and a service network uh, to maintain these vehicles. They, I mean, they would have to do that anyway if they're owning these vehicles. But uh, that would be one potential scenario that they might have followed. But doing that would require that they actually have, uh, you know, a working automated driving system, which they also worked on for much of the last decade and never really seemed to make much headway with. Um, although I think that, there, you know, there were lessons learned from that effort um, that, you know, probably uh, filtered into other products. Like, for example, the LiDAR that they put on iPads and iPhones. Uh, I suspect that that, at least in part, uh, came from lessons learned in the in Project Titan uh, in the in the automated driving effort, uh, various other things, some of the perception things um, that you know where you're trying to detect and classify different objects is probably filtered into some of the work they've done on the the camera side. So there's a lot of a lot of things that you know they they've probably benefited from it from this effort, but ultimately. Um, you know, I, I am not at all surprised that they abandoned the, the project. They've had so many twists and turns over the last decade, so many different people leading the program. I know, I know a number of people that went to Apple, left Apple, uh, after working on it for a number of years. Um, and you know, people, and then, you know, there's people like Doug Field who went from Tesla to Apple to work, to lead this project and then went to Ford. He's at Ford now. And there's a lot of other people that I've known that have spent some time at Apple working on this over the last decade, but it just never, they never really could figure out a business model that fit with Apple's way of doing business. It, uh, you know, it was certainly felt like a revolving door between Apple and Tesla. And I'm reading Mark Gurman's uh, piece in Bloomberg titled Apple Car Was Doomed by Its Lofty Ambitions to Outdo Tesla. And you get the strong impression that Apple did something with the car that they rarely do, which is look over their shoulders at another company and say, oh, you know, we, we should do that and we should beat them at their own game. And uh, that has not that doesn't seem like that's going to end well 
especially against Tesla. Tesla really is dominant in this market. Uh, German says they had two schools of thought 10 years ago, roughly, when they started this. And I, I'm going to, you have inside insight to this, Sam, too. So if you hear me say something that German said that's wrong, let me know. But German also has really good sources. He says when they started thinking about this 10 years ago, they had two choices, either build an electric vehicle basically functionally the same as the Tesla or be more ambitious and, and I'm going to quote German, change the world with a full-blown self-driving vehicle taking passengers from point A to point B with zero intervention from a driver and make it look like nothing anyone else had seen before. He says they planned these cars without steering wheels or pedals, that you would drive it using Siri which anybody who's used Siri for any length of time knows is a nightmare <laughs> idea. Anthony, had you have you been following this story also for a decade? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't have any inside sources, but just reading about it, it's been this constant far off dream. Um, and I think, yeah, it was it was surprising in the sense that it felt like Apple had been pursuing this for so long. I just thought it would be kind of like, um, you know, kind of like Zeno's paradox, like just continually like the, the, the finish line, never actually reaching the finish line, but they just continue putting money into it. But in retrospect, it makes sense that at a certain point they'd say, well, maybe not. Like we don't actually want to like do this for 20 years and have nothing to show for it. I mean, it sounds like from what Sam was saying, not nothing, but no real commercial product to show for it. Show for it or yeah. the estimated $10 billion dollars that they pumped into it. There were, at one point, there were thousands of people working on this car. Sam, didn't they have a facility in Sunnyvale where they were trying to assemble the vehicles? Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to say what they were assembling. You know, th I mean, they did have a fleet of Lexus RXs that they had their... Um, yeah, people have seen those driving, driving around. System on. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I've, I've seen them driving around as well. Uh, but, um, and it may, you know, it may be that, you know, that that was just a facility that they were using for assembling those vehicles, you know, to to upfit those vehicles with all the sensors and compute that they needed. They may have been building, you know, prototyping some stuff there. Um, you know, I think, you know, German's second idea, you know, which is what I was talking about, um, is probably what they ultimately wanted to do. But I think the the reason, probably the reason why they got into this in the first place is you know they they recognize that at some point the the market for the products they were already doing like phones and tablets and computers was going to get saturated and of course we know that the the financial markets want growth and big stock prices big share prices are based on this having a a growth narrative for a company and if they're if a company is just stagnant and not really growing which is what the traditional auto industry is you know where they still have huge cash flows and make turn huge profits, not Apple scale profits, but you know big profits. Uh, but they they're not growing, and so they have low stock prices. And Apple did not want to be in that position. And you know one of the places where Tim Cook probably thought, well, here's an area where we could potentially really boost our revenue numbers, at least, if not necessarily profits in the near term, at least revenues. Because even though they wouldn't sell anywhere near the unit volumes of vehicles uh, that they that they do with phones or tablets, they would, you know, the, the cost of a vehicle, especially the kind of vehicle that Apple would build, you know, which not would not be, you know, a Ford Focus type of vehicle, it's going to be something more like a Lucid Air, um, it, that, you know, that even if you're you know selling 50 or 100,000 of those a year that at 100 to 150,000 dollars a piece that's a huge boost to your revenue line um and so i think that's probably what the thinking was uh, but you know the it, it just actually executing on that turned out to be way harder than they anticipated and I, i've said on a number of occasions over the last several years that you know if apple you know, as, as this thing dragged on, if Apple really wanted to just get into the car business, what they should have done was just bought Lucid because Lucid is a company very much in the Apple mold in terms of 
the types of vehicles they build, the design uh, ethos that they have, um, you know, very, very advanced uh, technologies. And of course, Lucid's head of software is a guy named Mike Bell, who was formerly at Apple. Um, so I think, you know, that's what they probably should have done if they, if they wanted to continue that down this path. And Apple, you know, could have taken what Lucid is already doing and take the expertise that Apple has in supply chain management, for example, and really addressed some of the big problems that Lucid has, which has been as a startup, just dealing with suppliers and getting components and getting better pricing on components. Apple probably could have fixed that and probably could have turned Lucid into a really viable business. Uh, but, you know, they decided they wanted to do it all on their own. And, and now they didn't. They're not. <laughs> yeah, according to uh, German who quotes somebody involved in the decision making, it was as if Apple had tried to skip all the early iPhone models and jump right to the iPhone 10 instead mm -hmm. of just putting a flag in the ground with a good enough car with an Apple user interface, slick Johnny Ive design interior and exterior. By the way, Johnny Ive very involved in the early days of this, we hear. And an iPhone-like buying experience. The company bet everything on the wrong horse autonomy. How important, Anthony, is it for a company like Apple to have the next big thing on the burner. I mean, Apple, Google's kind of, and a, lot of, a lot of our big tech companies are kind of in this position right now where they're looking for the next thing. Traditionally, that next thing came from somebody in a garage, not from an well, incumbent, right. in this case. Right, in this case. Right, yeah. yeah. And it, yeah, I mean, it seems like in general, also there's this, um, this search for kind of what is the next big form factor, the next wave of computing after the iPhone. Um, and it feels like, you know, there've been successes in, in, that, in terms of obviously like new Apple products, new products uh, from other companies, but nothing that sort of redefined the game in the same way that the iPhone did. It's kind of you'd be um, hard pressed to have the same impact on, on, on the world that the iPhone had. I mean, that's, yeah, that's I, I think remarkable. the main thing is you just want to make sure that if, if it does happen that, that Apple, if you're, you know, Tim Cook, you want to make sure that Apple has, is, is in the game for whatever the next wave is and hopefully is the one leading the way. I mean, obviously that's the same reason why they're, you know, invested so much in, you know, what ultimately became the Vision Pro. And, and I've been thinking about that, you know, also in terms of the discussion of like, oh, was there, could they have done something that was a little bit, you know, a good enough car and, I mean, it feels ridiculous to say this at its price point, but the Vision Pro in some ways seems like a compromise good enough product where, you know, I think there are certain things they wanted in terms of the battery, in terms of the transparency of the lenses that probably are not what they started with. But at a certain point, they realized, OK, we need to get something out there and this will eventually lead to the thing that we're dreaming about, maybe. Um, and it seemed like they couldn't figure out a path to do that with the car. It's interesting well, it, compared you know, the car to the, the Vision Pro. I mean, Apple's a big enough company and has enough m money to have separate parallel tracks, but it does feel like the Vision Pro beat the Apple car. And one of the problems, according to German and others, that the Apple car had was it was going to have to be a $100,000 car, meaning it's already in the super luxury category. And even then, that the profit margins would be non-existent. So it wasn't a traditional Apple Right now, its profit margins hover around 40%. Uh, of course, it didn't happen initially with the iPhone. It takes a while, you know, build up that uh, ability. But still, 0% is not, it's not close to 40%. <laughs> well, and so this would have been a tough, a tough road to hoe. I don't think Apple's making much money on the Vision Pro, but it's probably not losing money on it either. I think, you know, the, the interesting thing about Apple, when you look at the new products they've launched, iPhone, iPad, uh, you know, the, the vision pro, the watch, you know, each one of these was strangely enough, both good enough and also leapfrogging the competition. But the yeah, competition existed, ways, which is why the car yeah. might've made sense for them. Cause we could take an existing category and put the app, sprinkle the Apple magic dust on it. And suddenly, you know, profit. Except, except that, you know, in those other segments where Apple had entered, none of the competition that was already there was actually really very good. True. And so even more dominant, you know, they, well, Blackberry yeah. was dominant, I guess, but uh, yeah, but I mean, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't really that great a product. Um, and so, you know, with, uh, with the car, 
you know, there's a lot of really, really good products out there from a lot of manufacturers around the world. And, um, you know, being good enough would not be enough. And, and I don't, I don't know that there's enough Apple magic that you could sprinkle on that unless you've, you know, Apple would really need to find a way to be not just good enough, but in find some fundamental way that it leapfrogs the competition like they did with the iPhone, you know, with, with the touch screen and the, the multi-touch interface with the, the, uh, the watch, you know, and it's form factor. And even though it was limited in battery life, you know, some of the things it could do and even the, the, the vision pro, you know, for all its flaws and foibles, you know, it does, you know, it is, the you know in many ways you know the best vr headset that's been created um and that, could they have done that with a car I, could they have created I, the I, best car ever well i think that's what they were trying to do with the move towards automated driving right i you know i think just creating another ev would not have been enough right it, it would it would not be sufficient to you know given the the level of competition that is in that market and there's some you know, pretty the good people. Margins. I mean, Tesla's yeah. good. I mean, Lucid's good. Mm -hmm. uh, I yeah. love my well, i5. I just bought a BMW. That's a really, really nice vehicle. Yeah. It'd be hard well, for Apple. Apple would have to do something special, like not putting a steering wheel or pedals in it. To really and that's make what it they, I think that's out. what they were trying to do. Yeah. Uh, you know, and now, you know, over the last couple of years in particular, um, you know, I think a, a big part of Apple's strategy would have been to really try to make some inroads into China. You know, which is by far and away the biggest automotive market. Um, and, you know, until a few years ago, foreign brands, you know, had dominated the, the Chinese market. You know, there were a lot of Chinese brands, but in terms of, of sales, the majority, a significant majority of sales were Western brands, you know, brands from Europe, from even from North America. Um, but over the last few years, that has really shifted. BYD now, is dominant. Chinese, is is BYD Chinese domestic brands now yeah. have a significant majority of yeah. sales in China. They're about sixty percent of Chinese in sales fact, now. Here and they growing. come, and they're coming, and, and especially on the EV front. Right. So it would have been really hard, and and they make they are making some really great EVs for a lot less than a hundred thousand dollars. Right. And I think it would have been nearly impossible for Apple to really be competitive in that marketplace. I think this is the problem Apple has with Vision Pro 2, which is it takes a while to get to this point and you're you're shooting at a moving target and you can you can try to skate to where the puck is going but it's hard to know. I think they they developed the Vision Pro, they started developing it 8 years ago when it looked like VR was going to be the next big thing. Uh the problem with the cars is autonomy didn't happen. So they didn't really have anything. They were skating to a place the puck never went. I think they may have the same problem with Vision Pro, to be honest. I think this was something that people were excited about five years ago, but are much less excited about now. So has Apple lost its uh, its mojo, Anthony, or is it too early to say? Um, I think it's probably too early to say. It yeah. feels like, again, if, if, if I feel like if Apple doesn't have its mojo, I'd be hard-pressed to think of a company that I could point to and say, oh, this is sort of setting the agenda that's that's you know at the cutting edge um in a way that and in a consistent way that apple is not um because again it feels like we are in this in-between period where there's plenty of interesting new products but nothing that's sort of setting the agenda in in that well, way and, and sort of you get companies kind of flailing around a bit well you could what if the agenda is now ai and the companies setting the agenda are open ai uh microsoft nvidia uh, what if Apple said, well, we think the next big thing in 2024 is going to be self-driving vehicles and 2025 is going to be VR and they just, they missed and it turned out to be AI. Right. Well, it's interesting. I mean, those things are not completely separate, right? Because no, it's if, agreed. If yeah. AI, yeah, you know, is, turns out to be the next big thing, then actually maybe auto if autonomy has sort of stalled right now, that may, five years from now, we might say, oh, actually maybe they should have kept the project going because there were leaps forward and suddenly self-driving seems like a good bet again. It's, it's hard to say. And, and I, th I agree. I think, you know, that given the, the need, you know, or at least the perceived need to make a big push into the AI front, you know, w another reason for killing the car project at this point is, 
you know, there were a lot of software engineers working on this. You know, modern modern vehicles are all software defined. And a lot of that software definition is around AI related uh, capabilities. Um, and particularly the automation, but even even other elements within the vehicle. And so there's probably a lot of skill sets that were tied up in Project Titan that they can utilize better in the near term for generative AI efforts around the throughout the rest of the company. Well, yeah, it may be that in fact, that's what they did, right? They took those engineers mm -hmm. Um, I'm suppose there's some metal benders in there that won't have a job at Apple. I mean, AI doesn't. Yeah, really but need... they'll 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 find they'll find. I mean, they've got Apple on their resume. They will find oh, other yeah. places to work. There plenty of car companies yeah, without, would love without to. too much difficulty. Yeah, would yeah. love to see what Apple was doing and say what could we what could we use, what could we apply to our current projects. You know, I, uh, Fisker is looking for a, a, a white knight at this point, right? Um, well, actually, it's been reported. It was reported uh, that on Thursday they did their Q4 earnings and issued a going concern warning in their earnings report. The next day, a report came out from Reuters that they're in talks with Nissan, uh, with Nissan potentially um, uh, providing, you know, investing $400 million to help uh, with development of Fisker's next batch of products, uh, including the Alaska pickup truck. And uh, part of that is Nissan wants to be able to build uh, a Nissan branded version of that truck. They would love to get uh, a midsize electric pickup truck into the marketplace. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, look, I don't, I don't think Apple screwed up in any way. It's very hard to predict the future, uh, and in projects like this where it takes years to develop, it's easy to miss the boat. I, it's clear the car missed the boat. I kind of in my heart think vision pro might have missed the boat as well that it it was not the product that we need right now it's too expensive it's too complicated to build and most importantly i think the mass audience doesn't really want to wear a computer on their face i don't <laughs> same same okay i mean well. it, it feels like a, a lot of things where we saw them um in science fiction and it seemed cool then but when you actually think about yeah. it in your own life it is not quite as compelling yeah you probably not the best idea to use sci-fi as your uh you know your uh, idea your machine. product planning yeah your product planning division <laughs> although elon's done all right with it um some companies have done okay with it it, right. I, Arguably, that's what the iPad is, too, is, you know, like yeah, the iPad's, take those tablets yeah, from Star Trek. Yeah, sure. Well. And Lenovo's yeah, and clear, clear screen laptop from Marble Word <laughs> Congress this week. That's that's nobody wants that. But it's clear. straight out of the expanse. <laughs> straight out of the expanse. Right. And I, I but imagine it looks cool. It does. It does. <laughs> is it in the expanse where they had the clear phones as well? They're holding yeah, up those clear, clear phones? The, yeah, the clear handsets. Yeah. You know, they were like phone slash tablet yeah. handsets. And yeah, it was a, a transparent screen um, and just had like a little bar at the bottom where presumably whatever the power source was and the compute um, you know, was, was embedded in that. Uh, mashed potato on our Discord saying I would throw folding phones into that pile of sci-fi inspired products that nobody really wants the difference oh, i see a surprising number of galaxy z folds and I, uh, around i have a couple of them various people but i i think that uh, like a lot of people who are buying those are buying them because of sci-fi also right uh yeah. i think that what we're seeing that's a little different here in the early days of technology these are small companies that failed fast you know they had limited funds they tried something and a few companies made something that that moved them to the next level, but a lot of companies went away. Now you're seeing companies that have virtually unlimited funds uh, try this stuff. And it, and in some cases, as with the Vision Pro, try it in public. In some cases, as with the card, not so public. But still, I mean, you know, who else could have said, we're going to build a level five autonomous car by the year 2026? Maybe Elon. Yeah, I, I don't you know. You know, I have... Well, Elon's been saying that it would be next year for the last yeah, decade. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> um, you know, but you know, I, I actually, I, I'm, I'm actually glad that you know companies that have resources are spending at least True. some decent amount of those resources sure. on advanced R and D. Um, you know, we need, we need more of that. You know, just, just doing basic research. 
Uh, we need we need more of that. You know, that's how breakthroughs happen. You know, and ideally, you know, the government would also be spending more on basic research, you know, and then making that the results of that research available to everyone to to then commercialize it and industrialize it. Uh, but, you know, in the absence of that, you know, at least having companies that are willing to to invest, you know, in understanding what 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 they can make work, what doesn't work. You know, and, you know, in the case of Apple, OK, yeah, they spent 10 billion dollars on this, but they can afford you know, they that. Have a, they have a mountain of cash the size yeah. of Mount Everest, you know, so that's that's one month's profit for yeah. Apple. <laughs> it's it's nothing. Right. It feels like a paradox that I would imagine that if you're, you know, a publicly traded tech company, on the one hand, I imagine that investors are not happy they found out that you put $10 billion into this and didn't have, you know, a, a commercial product to show for it. But they also wouldn't want you to not invest in these kinds of big moonshot things, because then you're definitely going to be obsolete 10 years from now. Yeah. Um, this I was going to show you this. This I I've just ordered these and never. <laughs> this <laughs> is the other end of the uh, Vision Pro spectrum. This is this, this I, is where I would actually like to have a transparent screen. This is what I want, right? Yeah. This is a I don't heads want a transparent up transparent laptop. A heads up display on your spectacles. Admittedly geeky, but not not as geeky as walking around with a Vision Pro. Uh, it's got AI in it. Now I'm sure this will be kind of a early day version 0.1 product, but they're only a few hundred bucks. I think this is closer to what people want with, with AR. This is from brilliant.xyz. Um, they're going to come mid April. I'll wear them on a show and uh, you can, you can all mock me. Uh, I assume Apple would say that this is closer to what they wanted too. Yeah, but, but why like, didn't they the do this? Pros. Why did they go? <laughs> I don't know. I'm yeah. not a hardware expert, but the sense I get is that's what I meant by the Vision Pro being a compromise was essentially that they wanted to be able to show this cool stuff on your screen, but the lens technology isn't there to do what they want to do. So they had to like have this, you know, complicated camera setup where it looks like it's transparent, but actually there's all these cameras and, you know, like, it, yeah, a compromise, a, a very expensive and complicated compromise that apparently is also cool, but maybe is not what anyone wants. So I ordered these, they have... Uh I like how they charge. <laughs> they have um, so there's no there's no a battery hanging off of you. They charge up. I don't know what the battery life could possibly uh, be. They do. Uh, you I got I ordered lenses, so they're prescription lenses in here. I mean, look, I know these are going to be silly, uh, but <laughs> but I just feel like this Apple should have done something closer to this than uh, the Vision Pro. This is where you get in trouble when you have when you're a three trillion dollar company with hundreds of billions of dollars in cash just sitting around. You maybe overdo it. You try to build a level five aut autonomy car without pedals or a steering wheel, or you try to build a computer on your face, like uh, William Gibson wrote about in Neuromancer, and maybe you go too far. Maybe a little company like Brilliant Labs doesn't have any. I'm sure they must have VC funding, but they they certainly don't have. Apple money, um, if they can do this, Apple could have done this 10 times better, right? I just puzzle. Right, maybe me, the yeah? theory is that at Apple is that, you know, if somebody really breaks through with that, they could try to buy Brilliant in right. a couple of years. And maybe ago. that's Brilliant's I don't think plan, they've had a great. Actually. <laughs> yeah. It's, they don't seem to have had like a great track record in terms of taking startup products and really kind of getting them to the next level. I mean, you mentioned Siri before, and obviously that's kind of stagnated. Right. Brilliant is uh, in Hong Kong. They have fewer than 10 employees. Well, I'm looking at Crunchbase just to see what their total. Funding. Oh, I don't have an account. Maybe I can get you, Anthony. <laughs> you probably have, <laughs> you probably still have a Crunchbase account. Uh, <laughs> they raised three million dollars seed fund. That's it. From um, oh no, and then another three million a few months later. This was la in 2023. So um, from Coho Deep Tech Wayfair Foundation, and then Adam Chire and three other uh, small. This looks like angel fund investing, basically. Uh, looks like a t their first seed round was uh, in 2020, 50,000. So, um, yeah, this is a this is the garage I talked about, and it's it would be embarrassing if the garage came up with something and, <laughs> and Apple with all its trillions but, didn't. You know, the, well, the, well, the, you know, the thing is, what Apple wanted was not a heads up display. They wanted, you know, but that's what they should have wanted. Spatial computing. My, yeah, my well, point. I mean that that may be what. You know what, That's what humans consumers want. what we what we think we want. Yeah. But 
you know, Apple looks at things differently. They think they're, you know, what they traditionally do is look at, you know, they're, it's that, you know, looking where the puck is going. Right. You know, what, what, you know, this is, you know, consumers don't know what they want until they've actually seen it. Uh, and, yes. Isn't know, that so, what uh, so, Thomas Edison said as if, I, uh, maybe not Thomas, Edison, Henry Ford, it, it, maybe it's apocryphal that he said, if I asked yeah. people what they wanted, they would it's have a faster said, horse, a faster horse. Right. Right. And, and, you know, it's the same sort of thing here. You know, I think, you know, Apple figured that a heads up display, especially after, you know, the failure of Google glass, you know, they probably figured a heads up display is not, not going to be more than a curiosity. Right. Um, even, even if it's a, a really good one. And so they wanted to create, you know, a real augmented reality capability. And, you know, as as you know, Jason and Alex and everybody have said on on Mac Break Weekly, it, it's just that's technology that just does not exist in a viable form today, and probably won't for a decade or more. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's fun for uh, us uh, to cover. Um, I. It, I don't have any schadenfreude that they killed the car project. I'm disappointed. I would have been interested to see what they came up with. Um, I have a lot of Apple products. I probably would have bought an Apple car. I can I can see. I'll, I'll be curious to read the oral history of the project yeah. someday. Yeah. Um, yeah. It shows sure. you, though, that you can have unlimited funds, unlimited access to the best minds, right? You, you would mm -hmm. agree, Sam, that, I mean, they, they mm -hmm. could have anybody they wanted. Yeah. Uh, and still not do a product. Is it? See, this is the thing that worries me in a more global war, uh, fashion. Is it a kind of a realization that oh, we're not, we can't do level five autonomy? And, and oh, that, that's been a that's been a realization for a long time. You know, except for the hype, you know, from Musk uh, and his fans. Everybody else that's involved that's been involved in this has recognized a long time ago that level five is probably never going to happen. Never? You know, and never. Uh, you know, never? Uh, I will or, never be able to get into... Well, I can get into a Waymo now in San Francisco. Well, and it'll okay, take me to so the, 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 difference, the only difference between level four and level five, level four is what we have today with Waymo. Okay. And, level, you know, and that means a vehicle that can drive itself fully automated without any human intervention, but within a limited operating domain. And so, incidentally, we believe, certainly with Cruise and I bet with Waymo, there is human intervention fairly frequently, right? That the drivers yes. at the home office take over yes. and get around the pothole. Right. So, um, you know, level five just means that there is no limit on that operating domain, that it can do it on any road, in any con any weather conditions, you know, anytime. Basically, anywhere where a human can drive, it can do it. So that's the only difference between four and five. You know, I think Apple, you know, Probably, you know, it, with enough effort, probably could have done a level four system. You know, level four systems exist. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think maybe they decided that that wasn't good enough uh, or they weren't. You know, and there's been a lot of companies that have tried to do even level four. And even that is an, an extraordinarily difficult problem. And many companies have tried and failed to so get something that is good enough. The reason I bring this up is it... You're, um, <sighs> One of the questions that is constantly coming up on all of our shows in the last year is, are we in an actual AI revolution or are we headed toward another AI winter where we think this thing is going to become amazing and in fact, oh, it can't really do that. And I feel like the car example is kind of an example of that, oh, we had high hopes, but we can't do it because it turns out the the uh, the hard things are easy. The easy things are hard. It's the last percent. The, thing, the things that are easy for humans, yeah, are hard for are AI. hard for AI. Yeah. And and I'm wondering, maybe it's a mistake to extrapolate, but I, I I I'm wondering, does it mean that in many cases our ambitions are going to be thwarted and we're going to be disappointed? Is this just the first AI project to fail in what will be a domino of others? Anthony, am I? Am I over projecting here? Uh, I definitely had a very similar thought. Um, and, and again, with the caveat that, you know, I'm just a, a layman journalist reading about these things. But in terms of a parallel, it definitely seemed like a powerful one to me that, you know, it, it also made me think of how, again, we were talking about kind of 
letting sci-fi do your kind of product ideation. And it feels a little bit like with, with autonomy that if you set the dream as, oh, we should just be able to get in a car and then, you know, there's no steering wheel and we don't have to do anything, then sure, then it's a failure. But actually, wow, if we've like introduced all these features, not all of them great, not, you know, some of them very problematic and dangerous, but overall we've introduced all these features in the last decade or so that have made driving really different and easier and better and safer in some ways. So even if we never get to this, you know, glorious utopia um, of, of full, you know, level five self-driving, that's still like an incredible advance in technology. And I sort of feel like the same in AI that partly because for a variety of reasons, but maybe partly because it's a bunch of like technical people who it seems like they, the, their dream is like, well, what if we just automate everything? What if, you know, um, 10 years from now, Twit is just three AI talking heads, like chatting with each other. When I don't actually think that's what's promising or exciting about the technology. I think it's, again, doing the things that are hard for humans and the hum and humans get to continue doing the things that, that we're good at. And, and I think the balance will probably look very different from the way it looks today, but I think there is an incredible amount of, of hot air in the in AI right now, but also that there will be valuable technologies that, that come out of it at the same time. I think, there, yeah, I think a lot of VCs are going to be in trouble. A lot of startups are going to go away, but, you know, it's not going to be like crypto where it feels like, you know, the whole thing just kind of vanished into thin air. I think you're 100%. Yeah, I, I agree. Right. I, I agree. I, yeah. I, I don't I don't think we're going to get to AGI anytime in the foreseeable future, um, but you know, as, as you've learned, Leo, there's, you know, there's a lot of really useful applications for this technology um, with um, within a more limited scope, a more limited domain, you know, instead of having a, trying to create a system that can do everything, you know, take these concepts and apply it to very specific tasks, like what you've done with your Lisp GPT, you know, or, you know, it create, you know, feeding feeding it a, a more limited um, corpus of data uh, to do very specific things, um, because you know one of the things within that is you can you know you're much less likely to have it go off into the weeds and do something unexpected because these are probabilistic systems. That is the the key thing about all the various flavors of AI is they're probabilistic, and we don't re unlike a classical deterministic algorithm, we don't really know for sure what they're going to do in any given scenario. But if you constrain the scenarios that it can operate within, it can actually do really amazing things. And, you know, that's, I think that's the thing that we're starting to see with the automated driving stuff is, yes, you know, pe people long ago realized that level five is, is most likely a fantasy. Uh, level four is really hard, but there's a lot that we've learned over the last decade of developing these systems that is already filtering down into more advanced driver assist and active safety systems. Uh, so we're getting things like LIDAR uh, and things um, you know like imaging radar sensors, better sensors, better compute that is getting into other vehicles, um, into, into vehicles that are coming to market now that will make them safer and help augment what human drivers can do uh, and, you know, to, to be able to increase drivers situational awareness, uh, you know, help them out in, in various scenarios that are more focused uh, rather than trying to do the entire task of driving, which, you know, despite the challenges that we have as humans doing that, we're actually extraordinarily good at, despite the fact that yes, 40,000 people a year die in the United States on the roads. Um, that number is going to go down, though, thanks to these ADAS systems. I believe yes, most uh, new cars I, 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 now are going to do. I think do, it will. Yeah, they're going to make a big difference. This is such an important moral then from this to take away from this Apple Car thing, is to temper your expectations. That uh, yeah, I would. L I personally would love an AGI to talk to that you know an a, a, a AI that was like another human being. But that's sci-fi. Temper your expectations and be happy. Be amazed, in fact, by the, where, how far we've come with and, and these we actually move things. forward. We've and, made and, huge and progress. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we 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 have we have moved the move the goalposts forward. Move, you know, and we we have made progress and we've made some things better. Even though we haven't necessarily achieved what we wanted to at the beginning of this, 
we've we've made we've made progress. You agree, Anthony? I think we're all in agreement. I I absolutely agree. I mean, I don't think it's always like completely in a in a straight line and there's some things that get better, some things get worse. Yeah, but overall <laughs> uh overall I feel like um yeah, the, the temp temper your expectations. And I think also like that can it it's not just about not being disappointed, but then maybe aiming for a more realistic goal. Like, again, you were talking and again, I don't know, maybe this would have ended in the same way regardless. But in the Apple situation, like if they aimed for a more realistic goal, maybe we would be talking about a real Apple car right now. Yeah. On the other hand, maybe not. Maybe maybe it takes these kinds of insane ambitions to get us to the somewhat lesser place, but that's still pretty damn good. Maybe it does take that. I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm, I, we're going to talk about AI when we come back. Let's take a little break. Uh, there's lots. Well, more you know, as, as they, as they, you know, as the old saying goes, your reach should always exceed your grasp. Yeah, but then be happy yeah, with what you a, do this, grasp. You may exactly. not get all the cookies in the cookie jar, but you got one. Yeah. Don't cry. <laughs> you got one. <laughs> Anthony Ha is here. His podcast uh, is, this is my favorite subject. If they would let me, I would do a podcast about this. Original content. It's about what? Original content. That's right. The the latest and greatest on, or not greatest on Netflix, Disney Plus, et cetera. I mean, Leo, you're the boss. You should do a podcast. I on should be too. able to do, yeah, yeah. But see, I'm, I'm hesitant to do a podcast that, Nobody will, you know, subscribe to. So uh, your original content podcast at original content podcast dot com does it. So I'm going to let you do it with your uh, your your pals from uh, TechCrunch, uh, Jordan Crook and uh, Daryl Etherington. Um, they're still at TechCrunch, but that's OK. No, no, we're, we're all. Are you all separated now, now from the. Yeah, from the I'm going to ask you about that, too, because, of course, in Gadget, you've done some work for them, too, is. Yeah, absolutely. Crumbling in front of us, in front of our very <laughs> eyes. Uh, no, I think this is a great idea. Are we? Here's the question, though: Are we still at peak TV, or is it is it not quite so peak? Oh, I think we're definitely coming off the peak right now. Yeah. I think there was, uh, you know, basically when when Wall Street stopped uh, believing in sort of like just setting money on fire to, for subscriber growth for streaming. I think then you'd be started to come down and, um, which is disappointing. In oh, the don't tell that, me it's money. It's just money. Is that all? <laughs> is it just money? I'm sad. I think the, yeah, it's too, I mean, cause obviously when you, when you're in a period where things are the, you know, there's some belt tightening, then there's less experimentation, yeah. less new voices, but also probably uh, more of a focus on a sustainable business model rather than, oh, you know, we'll just, we'll get a billion subscribers and it'll all work out. <laughs> so no more successions, huh? That's it. It's over. It's but on the I, other I hand, six, there's, there's still a lot of great content being created and it's not, you know, yeah. maybe not as much volume as we had two, three years ago. There's still a lot of great shows. But, but being wait created. a minute, because I think Anthony was going to say something bad about succession. Oh, no, no. I was going to say good. I love succession. And oh, I think, okay. you know, that is, a sh <laughs> that, I think the successions will continue. I think will what they? you're not going to see okay. is, is the show that they spend a hundred million dollars on just because it like sounds like a good idea. I think <laughs> that the, the, the sort of like, you know, let's just take a flyer on it. Here's a check for a hundred million dollars. I think that, that seems less likely. You know who did a so lot saying, of that? You're, is you're saying no more gray man? Yeah, that's exactly I think, what I yeah. was thinking of. <laughs> I think, I mean, the guy who greenlit Gray Man is is gone from Netflix, right? Yeah. So yeah, that's I exactly. That's right. Boy, it's so funny, Sam. Because I was thinking, now I guess that's it for Netflix spending a hundred million on a stupid movie like Gray Man. Okay, good to know. Good. You know, I I finally saw. I we Lisa and I make it a. Uh, uh, kind of a yearly ritual to watch all the nominated movies for Best Picture for in the Academy Awards, and we finally got the last one uh, last night, was which was Poor Things. All I can say is, what a great wow! What a great movie. Now I know Oppenheimer is going to win all the Oscars, but it's nice to see somebody take a really big chance, do something very different and weird, and uh, and I think succeed. So I think there are creators out there. We're still going to go ahead and 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 do those kinds of things. Uh, have you seen Poor Things yet? Yeah, I loved it. Did you love it? It's I your... did. Although I I I liked I seen two other movies by that director. I love your uh, the favorite. Stuff. The favorite was yeah, great. and yeah. the Lobster. I love the Lobster. He's great, and he in every one of them they're weird and they're a little magical and just 
off the wall. And I think, uh, boy, what he did with with obviously a big budget because they built all of that stuff was real. Those are real sets. Uh, it was pretty amazing. And he shot a lot of it on four millimeter, on a four millimeter lens. You go to Hollywood <laughs> and say, you know, I got this vision for a movie. It's going to start out in black and white. It's going to end in color. And then a lot of it's going to be shot in four millimeter lenses. <laughs> I think they I could probably have used a tiny bit less of that lens. <laughs> uh, it was interesting, though, wasn't it? Oh, well. And yeah, the music. It, was, it didn't look like any other movie. No. For sure. Yeah. So there are still uh, auteurs out there willing to take a great big chance. But you're not going to see the Netflixes throw $100 million at, uh, at something just nutty. Although Apple might. Apple might. This is true. Apple, Apple, might. Apple TV Plus is yeah. spending a lot of money. Yeah. All right. And Samable Salmon is here. If you love cars, you will love Sam's Wheel Bearings podcast, wheelbearings.media. Uh, you have, of course, the best co-hosts in the world. In fact, if I could just get Robbie back on this show. <laughs> have we booked Have we booked Robbie uh, for a show, Roberto Baldwin? I've been trying. He's been trying. Benito's been trying. Nicole Wakelin, love your podcasts. Uh, if you love cars, wheelbearings.media. Uh, Media. What are you driving uh, this week? I have the Genesis Electrified G80, which Ooh. is a lovely four-door luxury sedan that is fully battery electric. Uh, it's very quick. It looks great. has a beautiful interior. Um, and now I can even charge it at my local Tesla supercharger station using a magic dock. Oh, Nax. Nax yep. is everywhere now. Yeah, it's coming. I yeah. bought the last car that still uses CCS. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> oh, there's still there's still there's still lots of them out there. But Ford on uh, Thursday announced that uh, uh, they they pushed a software update for the uh, the Mach E and the <gasps> Lightning, uh, so they can <sighs> they, and and Tesla put out a, an update to their superchargers, so you can charge those using plug and charge now at a supercharger, <sighs> and you can also order your free Nax to CCS adapter. Uh, from Ford, wow. um, for uh, if you've got a Ford EV, you can order that, and they'll start shipping those out in a few weeks. I uh, loved so, my Mustang. I really did. That yeah. Mach-E was a great car. Lease ran out, traded in for uh, another lease on a BMW i5, and shortly after I got it, uh, it was voted by the Korean <laughs> uh, Safety Commission the safest car in the world. And you know why? Because of all the ADAS stuff. It's amazing. Yeah, the i5 is a fantastic car. It shows you a stop sign before you get to it. It shows you a stoplight on the heads-up display. So you, it's uh, it's I, it's great. They said it's almost impossible to get into an accident. And I've tried, but... Well. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try too hard. I'm not going to. I think it would, yeah, it'd probably let me if I really, if I really want to. Uh, our show today brought to you by... Thank you. It's great to have you both, Anthony and Sam. Our show today brought to you by Rocket Money. Oh, this happened to me again yesterday. Rocket Money said, hey, you know, you're paying this uh, $300 every year for uh, WordPress. You still use that? And I went, no. <laughs> I got my money back thanks to Rocket Money. How many people? 75% of people have subscriptions they've forgotten about. I know I'm in that group. When I started using Rocket Money, I couldn't believe how many subscriptions I was paying for each month. Campaign contributions for elections that happened two years ago, for example. Between streaming services, fitness apps, delivery services, we've all got subscriptions we forget about. But thanks to Rocket Money, you don't have to waste money anymore. It'll let you know and it'll cancel for you. Amazing. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels. Yes, cancels your unwanted subscription. Yeah, yeah. It monitors your spending. It does a great job of that. Helps lower your bills so you can grow your savings. All of that's great, but I love the canceling the subscription part. I can see all my subscriptions in one place. If I see something I don't want, Rocket Money can help me cancel with just a few taps. They deal with the customer service so you don't have to. Rocket Money has more than 5 million users. They have saved a total of $500 million, half a billion dollars in canceled subscriptions, saving members up to $740 a year when using all the app's features. I would say that's, that's low for me. It's more than that. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions. Go to rocketmoney.com slash twit. Rocketmoney.com slash twit. It really works. Rocketmoney.com slash twit. Got that $300 back. Thank you, Rocket Money. 
Uh, on we go with the show. Well, before before we go on, just one one other plug for a show that we started watching that's really good is Shogun on FX. Oh, okay. Oh, now, I need oh, to watch oh, it. I'm in meaning yes, to ask. Okay, good. so this is gonna be on Hulu as well. Uh, loved the book, the Richard the uh, Clavel James Clavel book. Read it cover to cover. It's about 800 pages. It's huge. Reread it in Japan when I was in Japan a few years ago. I remember the miniseries. It was good. I thought it was very good. It was, it was good. Not for great its time. Was it? Who was it? <laughs> we was actually watched a little bit of a little bit of it the other day. Those things don't and, age well, do they? Yeah. No, no. But the new one looks. It's beautiful. It's so really I've been well seeing done. the ads for, it and I'm I'm trying not to get. Richard Chamberlain was in it. Toshiro Mifune, the famous samurai, in the original one, and I'm trying not to get too excited. I'm so I'm really glad to hear you say it's good. We've watched the first two episodes. Yeah, it's it's excellent. It's a great story. And and, and if and if you like if you like stuff like that, I also highly recommend uh, Blue Eye Samurai on Netflix, okay. which is animated, uh, and the the animation is gorgeous, and okay. the the story is really good. Now you're getting me excited. It just came out, <laughs> and I and I was you know I didn't want to be disappointed. You know how that is. You go yeah. They they made it. I love the novel. I love the novel. All right. It's all about a, uh, what's it, 1850, something like 16, that? 1600. Oh, 1600. It's back in the sh yeah. shogunate in the, uh, in the samurai yes. era. Sailing yeah. captain, British sailing captain gets uh, captured, washed ashore in Japan. And it goes through some trials and tribulations and rises. Well, I won't tell you what happens, but it's a good, it's a great read. Oh, I'm so excited. Can't wait. Um. In fact, I think we will save to the end of the show. We'll get more some more original content recommendations since we got Anthony here. Okay, sounds good. We all love to watch TV, right? Um, all right, let's talk about AI a little bit. Elon Musk is suing. <laughs> <laughs> Open, shock. Remember, he founded <laughs> OpenAI with Sam Altman back, I think, in 2015. He gave them some millions of dollars. The idea at the time... I remember it was a big deal, was mm -hmm. we can't let these big tech giants own artificial intelligence. We need to have an open process. People can see what we're doing, can participate in what we're doing to develop AI for the people, not for the enrichment of Google. I think they were mostly worried about Google and, and others. Uh, Elon and Sam Altman had a falling out in, I think, 2020. Sam, one of the things I, th and I'm reading into this, but based on what I've read, one of the things I think happened was Sam said, Elon, this is costing a lot of money to generate this stuff. You haven't given us that much money. We need somehow to fund this because it's it's very expensive to build these large language models. They they kind of bifurcated the company into a nonprofit, just like the original OpenAI, and a for-profit arm got billions of dollars from Microsoft, probably much of it in four kind Azure minutes because they were using Azure to do the training. And, and you know, really, basically, Microsoft has, over the years, be, it's become a division of Microsoft. That's Elon's contention. He filed a lawsuit Thursday night saying, saying that OpenAI's recent relationship with Microsoft has compromised the company's original dedication to public open source Artificial general intelligence. In the suit, he says, quote, OpenAI has been transformed into a closed source, de facto subsidiary of the largest technology company in the world, second largest Elon, Microsoft, under its new board. Maybe maybe Microsoft's back on top. I don't know. It's a it's a back yeah, and forth. Depends you're, on the day. You're, you're focusing too much on facts. And yeah. Oh, yes. Sorry. Facts. Oh, it's full <laughs> We're talking about Elon. That's not what lawsuits are for. Under uh, the, its new board, remember, uh, they fi the board suddenly got scared and fired Sam Altman, to which everybody went, what are you doing? And Microsoft, Satya Nadella was furious, called the board up and said, get him back. They got him back. He's got a new board. Under the new board, says Elon in the suit, it's Elon's lawyers, I guess. It's not just developing, but actually refining, get this, an AGI to maximize profits for Microsoft rather than for the benefit of humanity. Now this, first of all, the lawsuit's nuts. 
You <laughs> right. <laughs> there, there's not a hope. Great, in let's it. start with that. Let's start right from that uh, premise because you can't. As somebody said, you can't litigate a handshake deal or you know highfalutin statements about what the company is all about. You're just not gonna. You're not gonna win. He's claiming breach of contract. Well, didn't they have a? Didn't they have a, a charter? That they or something like that that they set up when they created OpenAI. Yeah, but then he you know, he that, departed. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how how I guess the court will decide how binding is this founding agreement when the company has changed so much since it was founded. I mean, Elon could maybe say, "Can you give me my money back?" It was ten, I think it was ten million dollars. It wasn't a lot of money. Maybe that's all he wants. I don't think so. Uh, well, I think he got that money back anyway. Yeah, probably already. right. Um, he's really, Elon's afraid. This is what Elon's, I think, underlying concern is that artificial, what is an AGI? First of all, Sam, explain AGI. What is that? Artificial general intelligence. So, you know, unlike what we were talking about a few minutes ago, um, you know, the idea of taking these kinds of models, these, these probabilistic algorithms and applying them to very specific tasks, uh, an AGI would be able to do you could literally ask it to do anything and it could it could it should be able to do anything that a human can do so his concern and he was by the way a signatory probably the guy who started it uh to that letter saying stop don't do any more ai it's getting too smart we got to pause for six months and figure this out he is a big believer in agi in in uh, smart intelligent machines like better than human intelligent machines. He's scared of, of the Terminator. Let's be honest. That's what he's worried about. Um, so first of all, that's the premise of this, is that they're developed. In fact, he, according to the New York Times, his lawsuit leans heavily on a paper from Microsoft claiming that, they're, that they actually have, a, you know, a little bit of sparks of AGI. <laughs> uh, Microsoft Research Lab said, although it doesn't understand how, GPT-4, the latest version of chat GPT, had shown, quote, sparks of artificial general intelligence. Uh, and so Elon... I, 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 don't, I don't know that just, you know, <laughs> spitting out random things, random statements, <laughs> qualifies as sparks, sparks of AGI. Or even sparks of intelligence of any kind. This reminds me of Blake Lemoyne, the Google engineer who was fired mm -hmm. because he said it's, it's, it's conscious... <laughs> well, we may want to believe that, and I would be, I for one, would be thrilled. I would love to see. Well, you are, you are an, an accelerationist now. So. I am now. You obviously listen to Twig, our This Week in Google <laughs> show, where I talk about this a lot. I, I, you know what? We've had our time on planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm joking, Anthony, don't you? But we humans have done nothing but screw it up. And well, I don't think I don't think we need AI to put an end to that. I mean, we are we are very close to doing that ourselves. Exactly. You know, to, ending our, to, to <laughs> driving ourselves into extinction. Exactly. Well, maybe maybe and, AI will preserve our works once we've destroyed ourselves. Exactly. Uh, my thought is like, well, our time is pretty much over. Let's let the machines take over. And yeah, I've seen all the movies, but uh, could they do any worse? Could they? Anyway. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> probably, maybe. But well, why also not worse give for who, chance? right? Right. Yeah. Bad yeah, for it's us. All, it's all I admit. Matter, all matter of perspective. But we've already ruined our our future. So you know, maybe the machines can survive in a in a climate that's two degrees centigrade hotter than it's supposed to be. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, anyway, in the sparks of AI pay, AGI paper, um, you know, this Microsoft claim shows up a lot. Here's an example of uh, a spark. <laughs> you know, I don't, uh, you know, okay, draw a unicorn in TIKZ, which I guess is a graphic language, and chat GPT-4 generated this code. See what I'm saying? Spark. There's a picture. I don't, I don't know why they yeah. think that sparks. But anyway, this is, I think, a disease that spreads eventually among artificial intelligence researchers like Blake Lemoyne. Or uh, the the guy who wrote this, Sebastian Bubeck, that you work with these enough, you start to think, you start to hallucinate that they're thinking and they're you're talking to somebody. 
As they chatted with the system, the Times writes, they were amazed. It wrote a complicated mathematical proof in the form of a poem. Generated computer code that could draw a unicorn. That was the picture I showed you. It's not exactly a unicorn, but anyway. <laughs> Explain the best way to stack a random and eclectic collection of household items. Dr. Bubeck and his fellow researchers began to wonder if they were witnessing a new form of intelligence. Peter Lee, Microsoft's head of research, head of research, said, I started off being very skeptical, and that evolved into a sense of frustration, annoyance, maybe even fear. You think, where the heck is this coming from? Anyway, this, this is the evidence that Elon is using to sue OpenAI because... They, I mean, because chat, they're using ChatGPT here. Microsoft's. This is all ChatGPT four. Uh, they say Musk says OpenAI breached its contract because it had agreed not to commercialize any product that's board considered AGI. That was the big fear. The reason OpenAI was founded, and I remember this back in 2015, because Elon was convinced that we were going to get a, an intelligent AI, and he didn't want that to happen, and so, and he especially didn't want that to be owned by any company, except Musk, Tesla. Except to <laughs> or, or we didn't want it to be owned by any company that he didn't control. So there are a couple of problems with this. Uh, by the way, in the in the in the lawsuit, Musk's lawyers say Microsoft's own scientists acknowledge that GPT four attains a form of general intelligence. A, they're wrong, right? Mm -hmm. It's not. Well, and also we should say this is. Um, not a peer-reviewed paper. It's just, you know, it's, I mean, reading about this paper basically seems like observations we had while yeah. playing with GPT. It's a, like a, a freaking a memo. Of GPT-4. Well, yeah. Right. That has not been released to the public. Right. So it's not and, exactly and, the most rigorous thing. It seems like, yeah, just thoughts they had. And judging on the evidence, it doesn't seem that compelling or convincing. Yeah. And and all all that I've seen of, of AI in various forms over the last decade just reinforces to me that none of these systems, as good as they may be at certain tasks, not a single one of them actually has any understanding, and which is a key thing. I think that was one of the things that they that was talked about in um, in the the um, the stochastic parrots paper. You know, these these systems don't have an understanding of the of the things that they're doing. It's they're just taking the inputs and you know, based on those probabilistic parameters that have been set up in the model, you know, coming up with here's what the what the probable output should be based on this without actually really understanding what it is that the model is dealing with. Yeah. So I say and I I'm, I say that I'm an accelerist accelerationist in as a preface to this, because I want you to know I'm not against AGI. I, I would love it. But this is not AGI. There is no real threat of AGI anywhere in the near future any more than there is in level five autonomous cars. Because that, that would basically be like AGI, right? A mm -hmm. car that can drive itself anywhere, anytime. Um, so I think on the face of it, Elon's lawsuit is assuming something that isn't real. Not Wouldn't be the first time Elon's done that. Um, anyway, I thought it was an interesting... <laughs> Side I think light, to me, I what's guess. what's interesting about it also is that it illustrates how, um, and I, I think you both touched on this a little bit, is is that Elon's attitude towards AI seems so much to be driven by this fear of Skynet, of this right. Terminator right. future. And I think that what's scary about AGI is not if the AG, the AI becomes aware and tries to destroy the world. I mean, that would be bad. I just don't think that's very that likely. That would be I think bad. We the can far agree. More likely, yeah. <laughs> the far more likely uh, scary scenario is that it's not aware and it's just spewing bullshit and we treat it as if it's real. I and agree. It has awareness. That's the threat. The real threat is personifying it. The real threat is saying it's AGI when it's just a prediction machine. Right. Yep. Exactly. So Elon, in a way, is 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 falling into this trap that is the most dangerous thing of all, which is to believe this machine is intelligent when it's not. Hi, this is Benito. Uh, Hi, Benito. So Our producer, a wonderful steam producer. Let's hear it for Benito Gonzalez, everybody. Hi, Benito. 
So uh, I think a lot of these, uh, the researchers and stuff, they're just getting led on by the, 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 by the AI because it's really good at goosing you up and like, it's really good at talking <laughs> that, to you. Wait a minute, no, no, wait a minute. You think when you say smart. that, Benito, you're implying that it's thinking, oh, here's how I get these guys. No, I think, I think that's how it's programmed. I think that's, that's how it's programmed. I think it's, it's written that it's way. It's designed to do that. It's exactly. designed to exactly. do that. Okay. It's, it's, it's designed to give you the answers that you expect from a, it's, from a given It's query. in the nature of a prob probabilistic stochastic machine because of the the training material is all human written training material to generate stuff well, humans it go has wow been up until now that sounds just yeah, like now us it's being increasingly fed with with well, the ai generated it, garbage it may be going downhill so because of that yeah. but but the but at least early on in fact that's an interesting point because uh they say these results are unreproducible because this was done on an early chat gpt4 before OpenAI tuned it. <laughs> so this was perhaps the most likely to give you a, a response that humans would go, oh, that's uncanny. Because it's talk, it's saying our own stuff back to us. It's giving us the answers that we've already given <laughs> right. before in the past. Right. And that, that it is trained That's on. uncanny. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm not against AGI. I don't think we got it. I don't know if we'll ever get it. Uh, again, temper your expectations because this stuff is very useful without becoming intelligent. That's, in fact, it's a mistake to assume that's even in the cards. I think, right? Well, I think I think it's also a mistake to even be calling it intel artificial intelligence. I agree. Yeah, because I don't think it actually is intelligent in the way that humans think of intelligence. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. I, I did see some commentary that that what did stick with me in terms of like the lawsuit as a lawsuit probably isn't going to go anywhere. And it's easy to sort of dismiss a lot of stuff that Elon says at this point. But it does underline this sort of paradox at the heart of open AI that it started as this nonprofit and has been increasingly driven by, you know, the, the needs of its for profit entity. And it is important to recognize that, that they are not this, you know, impartial arbiter of the AI space that's just wants what's best for everyone, they increasingly are doing what any for-profit tech company will do. Yeah, I read the same article, which is, while well, Elon's lawsuit is doomed and is ridiculous, he's not wrong. <laughs> the, no, no. He's not wrong. He's not wrong about OpenAI. He's that's, wrong yeah. about those, the technology. Yeah, he's, but he's, he's not, not wrong, wrong that OpenAI open AI has betrayed its promise that it said, we're going to do this for the good of humanity. No, they're totally in the pocket of Microsoft now. Absolutely. Uh, but I, I would submit they this was kind of a conscious choice they had to because it was expensive. That there there's no way to do what they wanted to do without getting a big company with its own giant network cloud to help out. Now, have you used you're gonna you're gonna be at the the game developers conference in San Francisco in a couple of weeks, Sam, I know. Uh, no, uh, GPU technology. Oh, GPU technology. GTC. And in yeah, fact, GTC. not GDC, GTC. I always confuse those. Yes. And uh, we're actually going to cover NVIDIA's uh, keynote uh, from that, I think, because it's clear NVIDIA is very much involved in all this. The stock market certainly thinks so. <laughs> they have their own chat client that runs on their RTX, uh, uh, I think the 30 and the 40 card and certainly the 50 cards, right? Have you played with uh -huh. it? Uh, I have not really played with it very much. Um, I've I've played a bit with a few things like Whisper, you know, for using, I love Whisper. Use we use Whisper. Yeah, we use Whisper um, all the time. But, yeah. but I haven't I haven't really done very much with it myself. Because they so their own, they're not based on OpenAI's Chat G Chat GPT, right? They're it's its own chat. Its own. Uh, G I think Whisper is based on Whisper on is, GPT. but not Nvidia's. Yeah. Is that right? Right. Nvidia, Nvidia's got their own, uh, you know, there's, Nemo, a, there's a the bunch Nemo of, framework. Yeah. Yeah. yeah every, everybody's got different ones. In fact, uh, Mercedes Benz is using uh, is using the the Nvidia LLM for the equivalent of what Volkswagen is doing with G, ChatGPT uh, for some uh, new models that are coming out uh, in 2025. Um, so, you know, and, and we're, you know, the, I think the thing that you know Nvidia uh, the advantage NVIDIA has had is they've had these insanely powerful um, GPUs that, uh, you know, up till now, they've had the, the performance capability to do a lot of this processing, 
but they're, you know, they're also very expensive and very power hungry. Um, you know, and what's going to be interesting to watch over the next few years is there's a bunch of companies that are coming up that are, you know, the, the, the GPUs can, you know, because of their parallel processing nature can do a lot of this uh, type of uh, AI processing uh, very well, but they're not very efficient at it. And what we're seeing is a trans. I think we're going to see a transition towards more um, AI optimized chips that are fo really focused on doing the matrix mathematics that is essential to processing these models. And, you know, so they're going to be more focused that, you know, GPUs, strangely enough, you know, have gone from being graphics processing units to really being more general processing units, just with a lot of brute force. Um, and, you know, I think we're going to see a shift back towards more focused processors for these specific kinds of workflows. Help me understand this, because we've had a kind of ongoing debate on Windows Weekly, because Microsoft's been prom promoting uh -huh. what it calls an NPU. Apple right, has, that's, that's an NPU. It's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's basically a matrix math processor. Okay, Apple has its own machine language coprocessor mm -hmm. doing the same thing in its Apple yep. Silicon. How is that different from a GPU? It, the, the GPU, as I said, is more, um, I mean, it was designed originally for, for doing graphic a lot of parallel processing for graphics tasks to generate generate video generate graphics um but it you know because of its par highly parallel nature compared to a, a classical cpu like an intel x86 type of chip um you know it's able to do these these parallel processing work workloads uh that are necessary to do matrix math um it's just not particularly efficient at it. So is it fair to say force. an NPU is a GPU that's been tuned for the specific kinds of matrix math it, AI uses? It's, it's, um, no, it's, they're no, related, it's, it's aren't actually they? something it's, uh, they're, re they're related in that there's a lot of parallel capabilities, Okay, but it's a more, more focused workloads okay. that it's capable of doing. So, so the, this all you know, started an NPU with, can't do some of the things a GPU could do. That makes sense. This kind of all started with Intel's MMX, where I remember with these early uh -huh. instructions on the Intel chips, where it could take large chunks of data and operate on that chunk of data as a batch, right. giving it a big improvement in speed. Good for things in gaming like texture maps, which are large data uh, piles, uh, doing big transforms on those. And then the GPUs and that's, came yeah, kind along. Of GPUs kind of evolved from that. Right. And then, um, you know, these, these NPUs kind of really take and focus on these very specific kinds of operations that so are they're, specific, they're less generalized specifically useful for large language models yes well it, large language models but all, all you know all kinds of deep learning okay. processing so not just uh, it's not, so it's not it's not just uh LLMs, LLMs, but okay. a lot of different kinds all, all of these kinds of probabilistic things because it's it's all involving a lot of matrix math which sadly i was well i don't know if it's sad but i <laughs> I always had a hard time wrapping my head around that when I was studying engineering. We use it a lot um, in the, in the coding. Yeah, and, but and we, uh, we you know we were doing it manually. Yeah, you know, I know. In those days. So you've seen them. It looks like a Sudoku puzzle. Mm -hmm. It's matrixes of uh, rows and yeah. columns of numbers, and being able to rotate them quickly or transform them in a variety of ways quickly is a special skill that neither Sam yes. nor I have. But apparently <laughs> these NPUs are very, very good at it. So that's interesting. So it's gone it's gone from a kind of a general processing a large amount of data to a specific kind of math. And it's useful in a, in a, and this is the other thing you kind of need to know to understand this, is that LLMs, which everybody's singing the praises of these days, like ChatGPT, is just one kind of AI there yes. are uh, GANs, generate, generative adversarial networks. There are neural networks. There are LLMs. There are a variety of different ways to do AI. But is an NPU the, useful in all of those? The, yeah, the math workloads are very similar. Very similar. So, okay. you know, uh, uh, maybe a, a, another analog to this would be, uh, you know, back in the 80s, you know, we had um, math co or floating point coprocessors yeah. that we were adding. You know, the, reg the, the base CPU could do floating point operations. Yes. It just did them Slow. slowly. Yeah. And then they came up with the, you know, the, the three, you know, the 287 and 387 math coprocessors right. that were, that were 
specifically optimized to do floating point operations. So now we've got coprocessors that are specifically optimized to do matrix math. Right. So it would be fair to say GPUs are coprocessors designed for the kinds of operations you do in gaming and other heavy, heavy graphic intensive applications. And NPUs or machine language processors are processors, coprocessors, because you still need a CPU, mm -hmm. but coprocessors designed to offload a certain kind of math that's used very commonly in artificial intelligence. Would that yes. be accurate? Okay. I, I, to, to the best of my knowledge, yes. To the best of our knowledge. Accurate. Yeah. Correct us if we're wrong, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I was glad to be very quiet for that, uh, that portion. <laughs> well, it's something that comes up. And I think one of the things that's important for us to have these conversations is to kind of understand, at least in a rudimentary way, uh, what's going on here. Because we, we throw these phrases and terms around, but it's good, it's good to understand. And I think also it's helpful when you do that, it helps kind of, Maybe not, because these scientists who are working on these things certainly know intimately how they work. I would think it would immunize you a little bit against this disease of thinking it's it's thinking, but maybe not, because these guys know exactly how it's working, and they're convinced they're sentient. So I don't know. I don't know. A few of them are convinced it's sentient. Not I, not all right. of them. Yeah. I think a lot of it is is desperate desire for it to be so. Like, we really would love for these things to become intelligent. Right? I suspect yeah. in, in some cases also it's like when you have a deep knowledge about one thing, which is sort of about maybe how the, the language model works, but you don't necessarily have like a deep knowledge of like, well, what does consciousness look like? What do we mean by that ah. like philosophically? What does that look like? And like, Good point. So, um, you know, I think, yeah, I think there can probably be, I mean, certain. Maybe not, I don't know about the authors of the Microsoft paper. I think that's definitely part of what's going on with Elon. Where I'm not sure he knows deeply about any part of it, but certainly on the sort of like more humanistic philosophical side, it seems right. like he's pretty, pretty shallow. Yeah. I think in a way, if you had a very deep knowledge of one specific area, that would give you this kind of uh, inflated confidence that you understand the whole thing and make it much easier for you to do a lot of hand-waving about the stuff you don't really understand, but think you do. It's magic. It's happening. Look at that. Oh, my God, we've got intelligence. So you said, Sam, something I think fairly, I don't know if it's controversial, it seems controversial, that we will never see level five autonomy. Mm -hmm. Will we never see AGI? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's probably the I, right I, answer. I hate, I, you know, I, I hate, <laughs> I hate to answer questions like that yeah. in any sort of absolute terms yeah. because I, I, I honestly don't know, you know, on a, you know, on that uh, classical long enough timeline, we may see it, but I don't expect to see it anytime in the, in the near term, you know, or, you know, in the next, at least probably not in the next decade. Yeah. Um, I got a really good email from a listener uh, about all of this. Ah, uh, see if I can remind. It. He basically said I can't find it, but he was his point was we do have a definition for AGI and the and a distinction between everything up to AGI. Everything up to AGI is computational. At some point, if something can reason about something it hasn't seen before. So up to now, all the AI stuff is basically probabilistic based on things it's seen before. But if it could then reason, somehow make this leap where it could take something it's never seen before and do some reasoning about it, that would be a good definition of artificial general intelligence. It's not... It's not a rehash of something already seen, but something brand new. If it can come up with something brand new. Does that seem fair? That makes sense, but it also seems very squishy in terms yeah. of, I mean, I, I suspect if we look yeah, this up, we get more precise wording, but it's like, well, what is brand new mean? What is yeah. reason? Well, I'll mean give you an example. Just, uh, extrapolate. If an AGI never having been trained on anything having to do with that movie, Poor Things, <clears throat> never even having heard of 
Yorgos Lanthimos, the director, or Emma Stone, the producer and actor. But just kind of, you know, he knew all about, like, all the stuff it learned from from Twitter. <laughs> and then it saw the movie Poor Things. If it could synopsize and synthesize uh, what's going on in that movie in a, in a way that was insightful, I would say that's intelligent. Yes? Never having seen the movie. You, I, I think... Oh, I was I was going to say if it's yeah, if it saw the movie and could have a good conversation yeah. and it like, wasn't simply synthesizing what right. other people had said about it, but it was just reacting. Yeah, no, it's never saying, seen oh, any I reviews. Thought, yeah, it's never seen right, any information. Right. So all it is is basically taking, I mean, obviously it has some history just as we do, but taking that history and it says, you know, this is about, this movie is about a, a, a woman who is empowered and didn't know that she was just a woman, that she, she, she expressed herself fully without any limitations. If it said that to me, not having seen the reviews, not having seen anybody saying that before, I would say, yeah, good. You're, you're smart. You're, you're an AGI. Is that too low right. a bar? And if it was doing, and if it wasn't just like quoting things from the right. movie, but actually was able it's to never synthesize read any reviews. the ideas that right. were never spoken. Right. Yeah. I, would I like say that. That's, that's a fun test. Yeah. I mean, an yeah. even more fun test to me would be if you could ask it, was it a good movie? And it would give you a coherent <laughs> Good's a bad that wasn't word. just quoting someone good's else. Good's just a rigid value. You know, good, good. What does that mean? Was it, uh, I yeah, mean, how do, you, how do you define good? Yeah. What's, what's the context for? Yeah. Right. I, I don't care about the answer. Yeah. I care about whether or not what we have an interesting conversation yeah. about whether it was good. So Anthony yeah. Nielsen, who does, <laughs> maybe he's poisoned. He does a lot of our AI work. He works for us. Maybe he's poisoned. He says, aren't we seeing that kind of reasoning now? I don't know. I don't think, I mean, what I've seen is always just, it's synthesizing what's other, has been said either about this movie or about right. other kinds of movies. It's a fascinating area. I, for one, am rooting for uh, the AI to take over, but uh, I don't have high hopes of that. I will go out on a limb, just as you said, I don't think there'll be any, f you know, fifth generation uh, self-driving, level five self-driving. I'm going to say, I don't think, no, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say, I think we will see AGI. May not be in my lifetime. So, I'm, but I, I do think within, within a few decades, we will see some form of AGI that can do at least that, can reason about something it's never seen before. And when that happens, that's going to be really interesting. Will it be a threat to humankind? No, I don't, I'm not a, I don't buy into the existential threat. I don't buy into the thing that's going to suddenly say, you know, and by the way, great movie, but you guys, we don't need you anymore. I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, that that all depends on on you know how much agency we allow these systems to well, have. Well, that's true. Yeah, you know, how much how much we connect them to physical objects, you know, that have the potential. Yeah, don't give them to, agency yeah. to do things. Yeah, yeah, especially if it involves nuclear weaponry. <laughs> yeah, the irony of all of this Elon Musk lawsuit is. The week before, he was asking Satya Nadella for tech support on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> he, he says, I don't mean to be a pest, but... <laughs> uh, I, I, I liked uh, Paul Thorat's, uh response to this. You know, It's like, uh, I'll send you a copy of my book. <laughs> yeah. Elon, it started uh, February 25th, less than a week ago. Just bought a new PC laptop and it won't let me use it unless I create a Microsoft account, which also means giving their AI. He really doesn't like Microsoft's AI. AI access to my computer. This is messed up, says Elon. They're <laughs> this is messed up. <laughs> there used to be an option to skip signing into or creating a Microsoft account. Are you seeing this too? To which Community Note says, yes, Elon, it is still possible. And even gives him a link. To which Elon says, Community Notes is failing here. This option no longer exists. To which Community Notes, apparently he's getting in a fight with Community Notes, says, yes, it is. <laughs> By the way, Paul says how to in his book. It's not obvious. It's not easy. And Elon eventually says, Satya, I think he might even have called him. I wouldn't be surprised. Can you help me with this? Uh, I don't know. We don't know if Satya ever uh, dispatched a tech support guy. And Elon's real point is actually well taken, which Microsoft really doesn't want you to sign into Windows with a local account. They really, they really, really want you to create a Microsoft account. Uh, so but that's not news. That's no. <laughs> Elon wasn't really ready to let go of the situation. This is Gizmodo. One day later, he reached out to Satya Nadella 
to please let people set up a Windows PC without creating a new account. And oh, can you fix the email requirement too? <laughs> As of uh, Monday afternoon, Satya has still not replied. <laughs> I, I like Quickie, uh, Quippy's response in, uh, oh, in the I see Discord. You're, I see you're setting up a Microsoft account. Let's see. Quippy, not Clippy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, says Nadella Nadella, should have told Elon yeah. to go <laughs> Beep. himself. Yes. <laughs> Beep. Uh, wow, this is pretty good. So Paul Gregg uh, fed chat beat GPT a prompt. Imagine a scene from Club Tweet where all of the listeners are arguing over whether AGI is real. Copilot. Yeah, let's this copilot which uses ChatGPT. Let's paint a vivid scene from Club Twit where passionate tech enthusiasts engage in a heated debate about the existence of artificial general intelligence. The the dimly lit studio buzzes with anticipation as the panelists take their seat. Leo Laporte leans back in his chair, adjusting his headphones. His eyes twinkle with excitement, knowing that this topic will spark will ignite sparks among listeners. <laughs> and then it goes on with Megan, Jason, Dr. Patel, I don't know who that is, <laughs> arguing back and it's forth. Neli. Oh, it's Neli. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. <laughs> the studio erupts into a cacophony of voices. Listeners tweet furiously in the chat room, scrolls with fervor. Leo grins, knowing that his debate will fuel countless discussions beyond the show. And so, in the heart of Club Twit, the battle rages on. A clash of optimism, skepticism, and curiosity. The question remains, this is an AI talking, is AGI real, or are we chasing shadows in the digital abyss? <laughs> I like it. But again, I would go to that club. Yeah, that's a good club. But again, this is the, the, exactly what you said, Sam, the, the AI giving us something we already s have seen sort of and knowing that we like it and will give us more of that. No, that's giving it a, a, some sort of agency. It's not, it's not knowing anything. It's just, it's just, it, eh, that's more probable than that. Eh, that's more likely yeah. than that. It seems like it's a good idea. You know, look, looking at the countless, you know, data that's been right. sitting, written about this before. This is how you'd you phrase know, that. This is, this, yeah. Is, this, is, yeah, this is the way it would probably play out. Right. We will continue in just a bit with our wonderful panel. Uh, Anthony Hotz, great to have you uh, at the at the Grown Up Table, co-host of the Original Content Podcast. You can find him at anthony-ha.com and Anthony Ha. Every, you're on threads, you're on Twitter, you're on everywhere. I'm, I mean, I'm... Almost equally inactive on all of the platforms yeah, now, that's but good. I'm probably most active on Blue Sky and Threads. Yeah. Equally inactive. And I'm done with X, yeah. By the way, I know from math, equally inactive is the same thing as equally active. It's yeah. It's just different versions of the same thing. <laughs> that's right. See? It's all glass math. half full, half empty. Yeah. It's all right. the same thing. Or as the engineer would say, the glass poorly engineered to accommodate that amount of liquid. Our show today. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> Our show today uh, brought to you by DC Labs and their Apple Watch app, Stress Face. Have you ever sat, you know, somewhere saying, this is, this is stressful. I'm, I, I think this is stressing me out. Well, with Stress Face, you just look at your Apple Watch and you'll know Stress Face actually shows as a graph your stress level on the watch throughout the day. I've got it on my watch right now. It turns heart rate, it uses HRV, which is actually a very good way to do it. It takes heart rate variability information. It takes the readings from your health kit. And then it gives you a simple stress score on a scale of 1 to 10. I am 7 right now. I am stressed 7, which is not. By the way, it says fatigue is also stress. I'm not fatigued, so I think that's about right. That's a normal, good level of stress for running a show, being the master of ceremonies of a show it's a, you should have a little I, if i were one i would say this is not I'm not, not paying attention but it's good to know you know and if you're like having fun by the way i was eight i was number i was eight on a, a tuesday doing the tuesday show so obviously and here's some stuff so now if you say well that's i'm a little uh I'm a little stressed out. Look at this. I have some meditations. Crackling fire, waterfall, inner peace, great wall, mountain temple, candlelight prayer to help you relax. The app is free, but for 99 cents a month, you get that stress chart to see your changes in stress. You get a link to your calendar 
which tells you which events caused you the most stress. Stress phase captures data every two hours. You could take a manual reading just by doing a one-minute breathing exercise, and then it will report back to you. Also, when you get the upgrade, you got those meditations I mentioned, the breathing meditations, which, by the way, science proven to increase your heart rate variability and hence lower your stress. I've been reading a lot about this lately. It really does change, affect your stress. That's why the SEALs, the Navy SEALs, use square breathing, box breathing, to calm themselves in the face of high-stress situations. You'll also get high-stress notifications once daily to help you take time out when you need it the most. This is such a good app. Stress face. It's a watch face. Get it? It's a watch face that helps you reduce your stress. Download Stress Face from the App Store for free today. I really like it. It's, uh, it's a good thing to know. HRV is actually a very good indicator of how you're processing stress in your life, the flight or fight syndrome. Thank you, uh, Stress Face, for your support of our show. Uh, we also thank our Club Twit mem We talked about Club Twit a second ago. Our Club Twit members for their support of the show. Club Twit is uh, how we are attempting to survive in the face of some really nasty headwinds for content, for original uh, new media content like podcasts. Uh, what we do, so we have ads. We just did an ad. But ads increasingly are, are covering a much smaller part of our overall costs. That's why we're turning to you, our listeners. Club Twit is just seven bucks a month. You get ad-free versions of all the show. Ad-free, by the way, and tracker-free. There's no way to track you. We don't have any information about you. Uh, you also get into our beautiful Discord. You get all of the video from all of our shows, uh, as well as uh, pre-show and post-show audio. We give you some benefits, but the real benefit is you're supporting what we do. If you like what we do, if you find the conversations that you hear on our shows useful, if you listen every week, I'd invite you to join twit.tv slash club twit. And we thank you for your support. It is every week there is another layoff. And Gadget, you, you, you've, you've done some work for Engadget, right, Anthony? Yeah, I've, I've done a little bit of, of freelancing. And I knew the a lot of the folks really well because, you know, TechCrunch and Engadget were uh, corporate siblings. Right. I worked there for a year. Oh, you worked there too, Benito? Yeah. So, so in the middle of Mobile World Congress... <laughs> And Gadget just lays off 10 more people, uh, including editor-in-chief Dana Wallman and managing editor Terrence O'Brien. Um, what's going on? Is this part of the, just the general contraction? Who is the, who is the parent company of, uh, is this Red it's, Ventures um, or no, it's Apollo. It's Apollo. Apollo. Yeah. 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 So actually the funny, uh, not, not to make it about me, but I, um, my last day at TechCrunch was the day, was the uh, Friday. And then, um, uh, Monday was the day they announced they were acquiring, um, I guess what was then Verizon media right. slash Yahoo. Um, and, uh, I think it seems like, you know, then the, the, you know, TechCrunch has been hit by some pretty bad layoffs too. And so it seems like in, in both cases, the, uh, private equity folks are kind of like, all right, like you guys had a couple of years to try things out. And, and now we kind of got to tighten the belt, unfortunately. Uh, you know, and I don't blame uh, the new owners, although I have to say every time uh, private equity gets involved in anything, uh, they generally do it like Apollo, uh, like Red Ventures, like a lot of these companies and now own most of the media uh, titles, especially the tech media titles that we're, we're familiar with. They tend to do it with a lot of leveraged uh, debt, which puts a lot of pressure on them to turn it around, to make profit so they can pay this debt down. And so as a result, you see a lot of, you often see a lot of belt tightening, layoffs, changes, and you see some things that are not so nice, uh, like a turn to AI, to writing content. Uh, CNET's done that. Uh, I think Engadget did some of that. Um I don't think no, Engadget's done. They that haven't yet. done any AI content. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on, uh, the other day on the Engadget podcast, Devendra Hardwar was talking about this. He said Engadget has not done any AI stuff, any AI stories. But stay tuned, uh, generate because, stories. Because well, he said, we might all get an angry <laughs> email from Devendra if we say that they have. No, we love Devendra. Yeah. Devendra's still there, still doing great and, work. And he, he's still he there. also made it clear yeah. that they have no intention of doing good. That. Although, you know, he's he's there now. 
you know, who knows what's going to happen in the future right. because the person who's now in charge of Engadget and, and the other related sites came over from CNET. So, yeah. Right. I, I think, you know, the, it's just, it's obviously true that there's these very difficult headwinds that you spoke to, Leo, for any media company, especially any media company that gets a lot of its revenue from online advertising. But also, yeah, usually the guys who are in charge are not optimizing for the long term health of these publications. It's how much value can we squeeze out of them in the short term and then, you know, flip them for a little bit of money or, you know, make a little bit of money for a couple of years before I go off and do something else. Like, uh, I, I think there are real challenges. And, and I think the, the hard thing is, yeah, usually the people in charge are not the ones who are going to make the, the, the best decisions for the long term. And I mean, certainly, I mean, some of that's personal. I think Dana is a, and Terrence are both great people. And it seems like a real whatever needed to happen there, maybe like losing the leadership like that was not the right call. Well, and they've been there a long time. I mean, there are people mm -hmm. who've been in Engadget for 10 years, 15 years. It's, Engadget was started by uh, Jason Calacanis, right? It originally, and was sold. Jason and um, Peter Rojas. Peter, Peter Rojas. Uh, and then sold, and went through a bunch of owners, Yahoo, Verizon, <laughs> Oath. Well, and J Jason, <laughs> Jason sold it to AOL. AOL was the first right. one. And then, yeah, and right. then AOL subsequently got <laughs> sold and right. resold. And, right. Yeah. Eventually. I was, yeah, I was at TechCrunch for a lot of that. And I just made like a list of all the companies that I was, we were like owned by AOL. Then yeah. we were owned by, I think it was, Verizon. Uh, then, we, well, we, then we owned Verizon. by Verizon. So we yeah. were called Oath. Then we were called Verizon Media. And then right. now that's private equity, that company <laughs> is called Yahoo. It's yeah, but it it's ain't the uh, it ain't Jerry Yang's Yahoo. It's a different <laughs> no, it's a different Yahoo. You know, I, yeah, I, I you know I started my journalism career, my my transition from engineering to journalism in two thousand six. Great transition going going, yeah, <laughs> going to Autoblog, which was also part of that Weblogs Inc. group. You know, yeah. which at the time, you know, there was probably about twenty or so sites that were all part of Weblogs <sighs> Inc. Yeah, you know, and this was about a year after AOL had acquired it, um, and. You know, af after I left, um, you know, after it, um, I think, I think it was, um, yeah, after, after AOL got spun off from Time Warner uh, again, uh, they, they went through some, a round of cutbacks then and they cut a bunch of the sites uh, like TUAW and Download Squad that, you know, Christina Warren used to write for and uh, a bunch of other sites, you know, have, have gone by the wayside. And, and I think in Gadget and, and Autoblog, maybe the last, two or two the last two big ones still uh, still going well you know and i say this with sadness i'm glad devendra's is still there apparently uh max tanny at uh, semaphore released some internal memos describing the new uh layout of of the teams uh they're going to divide it into two different uh, groups news and features which will be led by uh, aaron saporis and then there'll be a, uh, a team called Reviews and Buying Advice, led by John Falcone under Lauren Kenny. Laura Kenny, Reviews and Buying Advice, of course, is the is is an SEO winner, right? That's that's one Google will push you to people to when they say, "Hey, I want to buy a phone. Which phone should I buy?" And that tends to be where you make money. Less so in news, Ever evergreen features. content. It's evergreen right, as well. Right. Yeah. Although this is, of course, part of the question that publications are asking themselves is that if Google, you know, just populates the page with a bunch of AI answers and there's no links or people don't click on the links, then how does a site like Engadget make money? Well, and it's getting worse. You know, I've been using on uh, the iPhone a, a new, it's not really a browser. They call it a browser, the Arc browser from the browser company. You can't really do a different browser on the iPhone. It all has to be WebKit to this point. That may change. And so what the what I thought they did was very clever. They basically merged a browser into an AI. I think they use perplexity AI. So when you do a search for which, you know, which iPhone should I buy, you you can get a traditional search page. Here, I'll I'll do it right in front of you here. You can get a traditional search page, but there's also a button. Don't pay no attention to the fact that I was surfing Seas Candies. That was something else. I was just else. about to ask pay about Pay no that. attention. <laughs> <laughs> so, There's absolutely nothing wrong Nothing with to see for here. No. The Seas reason, Candy is great. The reason I was on, on this page is my mom 
who's 91 and in an old folks home uh, and getting, you know, her memory's failing a little bit, FaceTimed me yesterday saying, I've run out of C's candy. <laughs> so I immediately sent her an emergency supply. I just, <laughs> that's why I was there. Anyway, getting back to this, that's why I was on that page. Which iPhone should I buy? You need to explain, Leo. I had to explain. So it's I not, could. It's not necessary. We understand. Yeah, I could We've press. There. It's okay. It's okay. You can eat seeds candy. There's nothing to eat here. You could press go and get traditional search results. But this is the insidious thing. There's a button called browse for me that then goes out. An AI goes out, in this case, to six different web pages. You saw Engadget in there, by the way, as well as seen it in others. And then synopsizes it in a page they make that is none of the above. And it has images, uh, you know, it has, it has recommendations, has information. It does give you some links. Here's Wired, CNET, New York Times. But you just skip by those and get the synopsis. And this is what's scary. So, this is what terrifies in Gadget, because so so what you're telling us, Leo, is it's your fault that these sites oh yeah. are all dying. Oh yeah, <laughs> forget those sites. I mean, if you if if you would just go and search all of those, you know, read all those sites individually, this, there wouldn't be a problem. But that's what's happening, is uh, and it's same things happening on desktop as well, but on mobile it's really pronounced. Is people don't want to surf. They're not. I don't want to read an Gadget article on my iPhone. Just give me the answer. And Google, to some extent, knows that, but AI is going to make this much worse. It's going to synopsize. It's going to summarize. It's going to extract the value from these pages, and people are never going to go to the pages. And this is what what Apollo's worried about, what Red Ventures is worried about, what everybody reasonably is worried about is, you know, Anthony writes an important article, but does anybody ever go to it if, if the AI summarizes it and gives them the answer before they get there? And I understand the concern. Absolutely. I mean, it's interesting because we were talking about, you know, uh, using movies as the test. And I do think there's been a little bit of this test case there in terms of, uh, you know, like sites like Rotten Tomatoes and Metacritic. And I suspect that, you know, that's had an impact on, on traffic because you can go to the Rotten Tomatoes and just see all the reviews. But there's still value in going and reading the individual reviewer. I suspect the volume is going to be way lower. And so what the economics looks like is, is probably going to be very tough, but I would imagine. So it's like, if you're just trying to figure out which iPhone to buy, then it's hard to, for an Engadget to, you know, just get that search traffic and, and have that be necessarily a compelling user experience. But if you're like, I really respect and enjoy reading Devendra Hardware's opinions about these phones, that's where there's still uh, some opportunity. Plus, of course, the fact that if all these publications go out of business and there's no information to synthesize for the AI anyway. And of course, we know that Reddit, which has announced its IPO and they put out a prospectus, uh, is now giving its content to Google for $60 million a year, which seems like, by the way, a low. <laughs> they could have charged more. <laughs> but remember, Reddit doesn't even own that content. Reddit's just a platform for people like you and me and, and 60,000 unpaid moderators to throw their labor into. Um, but Reddit's going to get the $60 million and Google's going to get the content. You know, And on the one hand, I think that's great for the AI. The AI will do much better having had that Reddit content ingested. But it's kind of sad for Reddit and it's even sadder for the real people culprits here the people who are making the content themselves and if you're like anthony or hundreds of other tech journalists we know who are trying to make a living doing this that's dev it could be devastating that really is sad i mean um i you know i don't know what the answer is i think anthony you and i probably have it's not a good answer but have the, the sense that well if we continue to make stuff and sam too that's personal and human no AI can ever extract that and give people the value of that. There's nothing like listening to wheel bearings or original content or twit that an AI could do, right? I think so. And I think also even, I think we're many, many years out from the point where they could actually create a reasonable simulacra of twit. But even if they could do it, what would be the point? Like right. the point is to hear Leo's opinion. If, people even if want they could, humans. You know, Right. If they could do a Leo puppet that was saying something that sounds similar, I, I don't think that I get anything out of that. That's like entertaining for a minute and then I don't care. That's what we found. We actually did a Leo puppet 
And it, it wasn't even entertaining for a minute. <laughs> yeah, you know, and you know, another example of that, you know, in in, in my space, you know, with um, uh, automated driving, you know, back in I think 2016, 17, 18, there was um, you know somebody that came up with this uh, self driving racing league, and it's like, why? Why would I want to watch <laughs> self-driving cars racing each other on a track? You know, I, I, I watch racing because I want to see what the drivers are going to do because it's, it's, it's a very human activity. You know, they, you, you know, they make mistakes, you know, yeah, and then you they're, the mistakes. they're making judgments all the time. Yeah. And I, I want to see how human drivers are performing at the highest level. I don't want to watch self-driving cars racing each other. I think if you're an optimist, this leads you to say the best possible outcome of this is that human created stuff becomes more valuable. It takes more work. It takes more energy, it takes talented human beings. And in a world flooded with computer created stuff, the human stuff stands out and becomes more valuable, not less valuable. There's more stuff overall, but, but we want, we're humans. We want other humans, right? I hope so. That's my hope. Yeah, <laughs> yeah my, that's the optimistic take. Uh, speaking of trouble, uh, South Korea has now lost Twitch. Here's another company that Benito used to work for. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Benito, you, you've worked for the best. <laughs> uh, the trail of carnage behind him. <laughs> every, it's weird, but everywhere Benito's worked is now folding and going out of business. So Twitch uh, officially shut down its business in South Korea on February 27th. Because uh, this is actually a story about net neutrality. South Korea, remember, do you remember back in the, uh, maybe this was a few years ago, there was this big debate. The big internet service providers, like Verizon especially, said, you know, Google ought to be paying us for transmitting your search content to you. To which people said, but but I'm already paying you, Verizon. Yes, but Google's using a lot of bandwidth. They ought to pay two in addition. Now, fortunately, thanks to the FCC and a sensible FTC, FCC at the time, net neutrality was enforced. And that never happened. In Korea, it did. They called it Sender's Pay. And Netflix and others have to pay the ISPs for the traffic they send across the network. And that's why Twitch is leaving. It's too expensive for them to continue. In 2016, South Korea, this is from, by the way, an excellent site, which is an absolute nonprofit, I'm sure. Rest of World is a global tech site at restofworld.org. They say South Korea instituted sender pay network rules in 2016. It's raised the cost for video streaming platforms. Twitch says the rising costs made operations unsustainable. So blame your government, Korean Twitchers. Uh, there is no good alternative, probably for the same reason. Um, Twitch gets 300,000 daily viewers from South Korea. The top Top Twitch streamers who are in South Korea receive millions of followers. Are you were you aware, uh, Benito, of, of a Korean Twitch community? Well, yeah. I mean, Koreans are notoriously the best esports athletes. They love it, so, right? So, like, uh, all the StarCraft streams for them. All of the like, there was a, they did a lot. <laughs> they did a lot for the community. <sighs> Elise Jang, a translator who streams her cello performances, told Rest of World, local Korean platforms have helped streamers on board on the new platforms, but Twitch have largely stayed silent. Um, and there isn't, and they had all sorts of funerals uh, for uh, Twitch. Um, there was, uh, there were, tw Korean streamers had virtual services in memory of the platform on Animal Crossing, on VR chat, on Minecraft. Others jokingly paid their respects in person, donning black traditional outfits and bowing to framed printouts of the Twitch logo. Here you can see a little Twitch ceremony. Uh, looks like My Little Pony, actually. <laughs> um, it's a, that's, that's an example. And this is why you may, I think a lot of people wondered, why are we making such a big deal about net neutrality? This is why. Uh 
Sender pays is not a good system, and it's costing uh, the Korean Twitch community. Well, and it also creates a system where, in theory, the people who can aff afford to pay are right, like are like the Netflixes uh, of the world. And so, like only, I mean, I'm surprised that Twitch isn't among that group. But you know, when you increase you know costs like that, often it's it's the the giant legacy players who can pay the bills, and it's the startups and the ups, you know, the newcomers who can't. Yeah. Uh, Meta yeah, I don't, I don't this. think Twitch has been profitable. You know, yeah, as, Twitch is struggling as as in of general Amazon. anyway. Twitch has never been profitable. Oh, that's yeah. true. Right. Has yeah. never. Now they're owned by Amazon, which does have some profit. Yeah. But yeah. Twitch itself is not, has never been profitable, says Benito. Meta pulled their servers from South Korea. They operate out of uh, neighboring countries. Um, There's an interesting uh, unintended consequence from this change in the rules. Anyway, RIP Twitch in South Korea. It's kind of a shocker. It's just not what you'd expect. And there is really no... My understanding from reading the article, by the way, was that you can, if you're in South Korea, you can still type in Twitch and you'll be able to watch Twitch. It's just that they're not basically, they're basically kicking off all the South Korean streamers. Oh, so maybe this is Amazon being a little petulant. You know, maybe that's yeah, what it's sure. really... There's some, I mean, maybe there's some sort of ongoing you know, uh, hope that they can apply pressure on the right. South Korean government right. to change things. I don't know. Let's take a little break. You're listening to This Week in Tech with Anthony Ha and Samuel Samad. It's great to have you both. Our show today brought to you by Wix Studio. All right, little debate. We've had some debates here on the show today. We have a little debate here about Wix Studio. Who gets more out of Wix Studio? Is it the designers or the developers. Well, first of all, let me, I probably should explain if you don't know about Wix Studio. Wix, W-I-X Studio is the web platform offering the flexibility agencies and enterprises need to deliver bespoke websites hyper-efficiently. But let's get back to the debate. For designers, you can create fully responsive websites starting with a blank canvas or you could choose a template for any layout. You could tweak per pixel with your CSS. And if no code is your thing and you just like, maybe you just like to move fast and get that client, their, their project, there's also a ton of smart features like native no code animations and responsive AI that adjusts every breakpoint. For devs, Wix Studio offers a powerful suite of homegrown web APIs and REST APIs. You can quickly integrate, extend, and write custom scripts. Oh, and I love this. It's in a VS. There it is right there. A VS code based IDE. And yes, you get an AI code assistant right there on the side to help you out. Plus, it's all wrapped in a rock solid auto maintained infrastructure. AI that writes your code or AI that fixes your breakpoints. Fully responsive editor or a zero setup dev environment. No code animations or. No code animations. Designers or developers, doesn't matter. Search Wix Studio. Find out for yourself. You're going to love it. Go to wixwix.com slash studio or click on the link on the show page to find out more. Thank you, Wix Studio, for your support of this week in tech. Uh, I went to TikTok this morning just to hear how it's sounding. This is an interesting conundrum right now. TikTok is facing a, a little bit of pressure from the Universal Music Group, one of the big five publishers. They have refused a license to TikTok. So TikTok is now removing all the UMG songs. And by the way, it's not just artists recording on a Universal label. It's, it's every artist who is published by UMG, which includes even artists on songs where they're one artist in five. All of that's getting pulled down, and that is a lot of music. Adele, Justin Bieber, Mariah Carey, Ice Spice, Elton John, uh, Ber anything Bernie Taupin wrote, Metallica, Harry Styles, Taylor Swift, SZA, The Weeknd, all disappearing. And remember that TikTok's genesis was they, they bought a, a company called Musical.ly, which was all about lip syncing. So it was very much a musical heritage for TikTok. And the use of real music is one of the things that made TikTok what it is. I know my son's TikTok channel was, always had real music on there, which really kind of enhanced it. Uh, I went to uh, TikTok this morning and there's not a lot of real music. There's original music, I guess other labels as well. 
Uh, sources close to UMG claim it has a share in a majority of songs on TikTok. TikTok says that number is between 20 and 30 percent. TikTok also says they've seen no drop in users since the music began to be removed. But I think this is an interesting battle between TikTok and, uh, and the music industry. I would think if you were Taylor Swift, you'd want your music on TikTok. We know TikTok's one of the main ways new music gets to listeners. It's like saying. Well, it seems telling that a lot of the, at least the commentary that I've seen from musicians who are not Taylor Swift level, um, they're actually mad at Universal, not mad yeah. at TikTok. It, yeah, TikTok I mean, Taylor says, is probably fine, but, but right. for, you know, up and coming artist, he's probably, he or she is probably like, well, this was one of the main avenues I could get my song heard by people, and now that's gone. This yeah, also, I mean, the labels take most of the money anyway. Yeah, yeah, whether it's doesn't go whether to the it's TikTok artists. or yeah. Spotify or any other streaming service. Uh, TikTok, uh, UMG chairman uh, Lucien Grange wrote, in our contact renewal discussions with TikTok, we've been pressing them on three critical issues, appropriate compensations for our artists. I'll put that in quotes since it has to go through the, <laughs> has to go through the label first. Uh, protecting human artists from the harmful effects of AI and online safety for TikTok users. TikTok says, no, they just wanted more money. <laughs> uh, Universal says, ultimately, TikTok is trying to build a music-based business without paying fair value for the music. But there are a lot of artists who say, this is how we get our songs out to the public. Uh, and without TikTok, it's going to be, it's as if you turned off radio, you know, in, the, in my day. Uh, no one's going to know about our songs, our music. I mean, does TikTok not pay you know the same sorts of fees that uh apple music or spotify or youtube music pay for, for each time a that's song a good question played. i don't know what the contract is and i don't see any numbers uh in this article this is from i'm reading the variety uh article um and it doesn't have any numbers so tiktok i mean technically it's tiktok right um, who did not renew its licensing agreement, which expired January 31st. But they didn't renew because they couldn't come to an agreement on how much it should cost. I don't know. I, mean, I, yeah, I don't know hard, who's at It's fault. hard to say who's at... I mean, obviously, I think, you know, there's probably plenty of blame to, to throw at UMG just because, you know, whatever money they were getting, they were probably keeping you know, the vast majority of that for themselves and not giving it to the artists anyway. But, you know, was TikTok underpaying relative to what other streaming services pay? I, I don't know. Well, and it also speaks to the fact that, you know, the online music, monetizing online music is still like very challenging and that mm -hmm. it, you know, ultimately boils down to, I think I'm, my sense is that unless you're, you know, super, super successful, a lot of times it's really just, you're getting the exposure and maybe a little bit of money, but, but it's really about the exposure that you monetize in other ways. And I think that, uh, you know, fundamentally that's a pretty broken system and that if your song gets listened to a bunch, uh, you should get a good amount of money for it. But it, I get the sense that universal is not necessarily the, uh, the best advocate for this position or the most impartial advocate. The other, the other, you know, way to look at it, this is very good for small artists who aren't on a label or, or especially on, on UMG uh, to get their music out. Um, wasn't it little Nas X who got his start on uh, TikTok with yeah, old town so. road? He bought a sample for $35 and bought some studio time cheap and recorded old town road, played it on TikTok. It got picked up. Lots of people, did their own like versions of it or their own, uh, 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 you know, what do they call that? Uh, duets with it. And, uh, and it became a hit. Um, I mean, there is another side to that though. Um, I mean, this is anecdotal evidence, but a lot of artists that put out music on TikTok, it's like they get popular for that one song and just like 30 seconds of that one song. And the people who go to their shows after that one song, they're gone. Yeah. Well, that's the artist's problem. That's an eternal problem. That's called the one-hit wonder problem. And there have always been artists who only had one good song in them, and that was it. And you always save that song for last yeah, at the yeah. end of the encore. How many times yeah. can Bobby Boris Pickett 
do the monster mash before you've said, okay, enough. Uh, <laughs> there have been lots of one-hit wonders. I actually love one-hit wonders, but uh, yeah, I think that they, they, that's that could be a problem too. Um, I think it's going to be very interesting if users start creating. I think this is what will happen. This is what this is what TikTok is so interesting for is that users will will solve this with their own stuff somehow with music, with sound, native sound, whatever. Um, and then others will duet with it and and reuse it, repurpose it. It's going to. I think it's going to hurt UMG and the artists uh, who work for UMG more than anybody else. That's what I think. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Especially I mean, those I, I that kind aren't of wish like that those was top the case. 20 or 30 artists. Yeah. It's, okay. It's not going to hurt Taylor Swift. It's not going to hurt Drake, Olivia Rodrigo. It's not going to hurt the the big artists because they already, you know, they were already exposed. But it's the it's the person just starting out who wants that exposure. Uh, President Biden has signed an executive order. This should change everything to stop Russia and China from buying Americans' personal data. Now, if he would just sign that executive order to say the U.S. intelligence agencies stop buying personal <laughs> data, maybe, maybe this would uh, do something. Countries of concern, which includes Russia and China, are now banned from buying geolocation genomic. You, you tell me China could buy my genome? Financial, biometric, health, and other personal identifying information. The real problem is, though, every time Congress, or I imagine the president, tries to do something about this globally, like have a bill that says data brokers, your, your history, the uh, law enforcement in this country pulls them aside and says, but yeah, but we use that. We need that. That's, our, well, that's, that's how we solve crimes. I, I, I would be uh, surprised if 23andMe hasn't been selling... Uh, genomic data. Do you think they China have to China? China? Well, they got my I'd spit. Get, well, get, give, given you know, given their financial challenges, <laughs> I, I would be surprised if they're not Maybe. selling it to anybody that wants to pay them. Oy. Right? Ay, 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 you, ay, if ay, they ay. aren't already, I think they will. Yeah. Apple has uh, given in to the uh, the people, which is great, and they say we are going to continue to allow progressive web apps in the EU. Apple. So a little explanation on this, if you don't know what a PWA is, these are apps you can write in JavaScript uh, and HTML, and uh, they look like a web page. And, and very few people, unfortunately, this has never taken off, although I had such high hopes for it. Partly it never took off because Apple's weak support, partly because Firefox took out support. But if you go in Chrome to a website, there you may have a menu entry that says download this site to your phone, and then you can use it like an app. It even has abilities to operate offline and store data in between visits and so forth. It's a really nice technology that means that any web page properly configured could be an app. Uh, Apple never liked this too much because, well, they make some money on the App Store, I guess, and they would prefer that somebody make a real app that they sell and Apple can get 30%. They took advantage of the EU's um, demands that they change the way the store works to say, oh, and by the way, we're going to kill progressive web apps as well, <laughs> even though it's kind of not related. In fact, quite the opposite. It's a way for anybody to have an app on, the, on Apple without Apple making any money on it. So it is already an alternative web store in, a res in one respect. Apple said, well, we're going to take it off because it's a security concern. Especially if they make us allow other browsers, this could be we could we we'd lose control of the platform. There was enough, I guess, enough response to this that they said, "All right, we're going to leave that in." Previously, Apple's page reads. Previously, Apple announced plans to remove home. They call them home screen web apps capability in the EU, as part of our efforts to comply with the Digital Markets Act. The need to remove the capability was informed by the complex security and privacy concerns associated with web apps to support alternative browser engines that will require building a new integration architecture that does not currently exist in iOS. Okay, I get that. You know, we're going to allow Firefox. I guess I get that. Not really. We've received requests to continue to offer support for home screen web apps and iOS. Therefore, hey, okay, well, since you care, we're going to continue to offer the uh, existing capability. 
So forget that thing we said about security and privacy. Uh, yeah, never mind. <laughs> The support means home screen web apps continue to be built directly on WebKit and its security architecture and align with the security and privacy model for native apps on iOS, just like they always did. This, to me, underscores the absolute hypocrisy of what Apple is up to. Uh, they wanted to kill it because they wanted to eliminate that, like, you know, little exit route for people to put apps on mm -hmm. your phone without going through the app store. And then they decided not to kill it because why? I don't know. Maybe somebody, I don't know. Maybe the EU complained. Probably. Un unfortunately, PWAs never took off. And uh, even though this would be a great thing, um, this isn't going to change much. I, I use a bunch of PWAs. Do you? On my, on my computers, on my Windows computers, and on my Pixel 8 Pro. Oh, tell me what um, you do. What, 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 what sites? Well, let's see. I, I, have, I have one uh, here for uh, a little app called Apple TV Plus. Um, Do they have a PWA? I, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a, that's when, a hoot. So there's no Android uh, version of that. So you can use the yeah, website right. as, a, yeah. as an app, in effect. It looks just like an yeah. app, right? Yeah, uh, it does. And, you know, I use, um, you know, a PWA for Slack on my phone. I don't I don't have the Slack app installed. Wow. On my phone. I use a PWA uh, back when I was still on on Twitter. Um, I used uh, the PWA version of Twitter instead of the Twitter app. So, yeah, I mean, I, I use a, a several different ones and I use a bunch of them on my computers as well. Well, was it you who complained to the EU? <laughs> <laughs> no. Because I mean, honestly, that was not me. When 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 Google and uh, Microsoft were the first to really promote PWAs, and Apple was always kind of dragging its heels. Uh, but I had such high hopes for this because it would make it fairly easy. We we would do a PWA for Twit. We have a web a, a, a website that has uh, a very robust API. It would be not so hard to take that website and make it a PWA, so you could have a Twit app on your phone. I, but we never did it. Partly because one of the big browsers, Firefox, decided not to support it anymore. Um, I think we probably should have. Hmm. I mean, does anybody even use Firefox anymore? So yeah, maybe it well doesn't matter anymore. Right yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Ev everything else is on Chromium. Yeah, and you know, looking looking at my at my taskbar here, you know, I've got PWAs for for Google Calendar, for Slack, um, for. Um, Let's see for uh, Mastodon. Wow. Um, or Threads, YouTube Music, um, Feedly. Uh, so, so, is this yeah, all? Are these are them. all these apps supporting all of the features of PWAs, or you've just made it? That's my home. You, you know, you can't with any page say put it on the home screen. Yeah. Uh, to be a there, true PWA, it has to have service workers. It well, has to like, have yeah, offline I mean, the, capabilities. The Slack PWA does. It's a true PWA. That that wow. you can, yeah, that you can do in the Slack wow. app wow. without having to install the app. Wow. So that's the reason you use it is just because you don't want to install the app? Yeah. And well, I mean, in some cases, you know, on, on at least one computer that I have to use on a daily basis, I can't install apps, okay. uh, you know, on my work on my work computer. Um, so I use some PWAs there uh, as an alternative. To me, that's one of the, the, the really exciting technologies that never took off. And it makes me sad that I really, it could have been a, really great thing it's not quite the same as just saving a web page as a, a a a button on your home screen an icon on your home screen it's a little bit more than that i wish apple had supported it a little bit better at least they're not going to kill it completely talking about the uh, f the fbi and law enforcement in the u.s uh turns out the number one tactic the one they really like now is push notifications this is a Washington Post article, Drew Harwell and Aaron Schaefer. So it turns out when you get a push notification, uh, it goes out over the public internet. And uh, if law enforcement can get it, it actually contains a lot of information about the phone that the notifications are getting pushed to. The breakthrough, this is the Washington Post, relied on a little-known quirk of push alerts, a basic staple of modern phones. You know, that's when you get a notification. You've got an email or a Slack notification, uh, you know, message or, you know. These tokens can be used to identify users 
and are stored on the servers run by Apple and Google, which, as it turns out, they're not encrypted, can hand them over to law enforcement. And apparently, law enforcement's been asking, and neither of these companies have really been saying, well, where's your subpoena? They just go, yeah, sure, here. Uh, now, of course, uh, this became a public when it was used to uh, arrest a, a child ex uh, exploitation uh, perpetrator, allegedly. Um, and if, so I'll, I'll give you the story. Federal law enforcement officer got Teleguard, which is one of these companies, to hand over a small string of code the company had used to send push alerts to the suspect's phone. Oh, let me actually let, uh, go back a little farther. The pedophile, alleged pedophile, had worked to stay anonymous in the chat rooms where he would brag about his exploits. According to the criminal affidavit, he covered his uh, tracks by using Teleguard, which was an encrypted Swiss messaging app. Um, and he thought, well, it's encrypted, I'm safe. But what he didn't know is that Teleguard also used push notifications and was willing to hand over the information to the FBI. That's wild. The FBI agent then got Google to hand over the list of email addresses linked to the code, the push token, traced one to a guy in Toledo who was then arrested, charged with sexual exploitation of minors and distribution of child pornography within a week of the Google request. Note the word request, not subpoena, not warrant. Now, these get publicized because the FBI wants you to think, you know what we use these for is the worst, most heinous, awful offenders. And nobody's going to want this guy to get away with it. So nobody's going to question it. But it's probably important that you understand that these push alerts really can be used to out you. Uh, Cooper Quinton, a technologist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, said this is how any new surveillance method starts out. The government says, we're only going to use this in the most extreme cases to stop terrorist and child predators, and everyone can get behind that. But Co Co Cooper says these things always end up rolling downhill. Maybe a state attorney general one day decides, hey, maybe I can use this to catch people having an abortion. Even if you trust the U.S. right now to use this, you may not trust a new administration to use it in a way you deem ethical or a state attorney general. So the Post found more than 130 search warrants and court orders in which investigators had demanded that Apple, Google, Facebook, and other temp companies hand over data related to a suspect's push alerts. Uh, 14 states as well as the District of Columbia... I guess they. Uh, it sounds like they do. Federal law enforcement fully comply with the Constitution applicable statutes to obtain this data, says the Justice Department. So they do, in fact, get court orders to do this. So that's actually reassuring. Mm, or at least reassuring they're right now, but it depend depends on which court and which state. Yeah. You know, some some court orders might be easier to get than right. others, you right. know, depending on which court you're going to and depending on what it is you're looking for. Like, for example, you know, if you're looking for, um, you know, uh, pregnancy care, uh, you know, in Texas or Louisiana or any number of other southern states, um, you know, it might be pretty, <laughs> the courts might be more inclined than they should to give, to issue those court orders. We first started talking about this last uh, late last year. Senator Ron Wyden sent in a letter to Attorney General Merrick Garland uh, saying an investigation had revealed the Justice Department had prohibited Apple and Google from discussing the technique. Shh, don't, don't tell anybody. Apple confirmed this in a statement in December to the Washington Post. Um Google said it shared Ron Wyden's commitment to keeping users informed about these requests, so it started to come out. Here's, the, uh, here's how this works. Unlike normal app notifications, push alerts, the, the things that wake up your phone, right, or you turn them off because you don't want to see them at night, but that they all come in in the morning, uh, many apps often push alert functionality because it gives users a fast battery saving way to stay updated push alerts if you have uh, cnn news updates that's a push alert to send the notification both apple and google require the apps to first create a token unique to your phone 
that tells the company how to find the user's device. These tokens are then saved on Apple's and Google's servers. You can't do anything about it. In effect, Wyden said that design makes Apple and Google a digital post office able to scan and collect certain messages and metadata, even of people who want to remain discreet. Uh, so, so presumably that would, you know, that token would be used to identify what cell tower that particular device was attached to? I think yes. And, uh, and I think furthermore, specifically... Uh, connecting that phone to that notification. Right. Uh, the question is what kind of information Apple has. Well, not only would it need the tower, it would need the unique IP address of that phone, wouldn't it? Uh, it needs to somehow know how to get a message to that phone. How would it know that? Whatever it, it is, it's uniquely identifying that and phone. If, and if it's if it's on if it's on Wi-Fi, then that you know if it's on a cell tower, then you know you're looking at a pretty broad area but if it's on if you're on wi-fi yeah getting that push notification you can really narrow down the scope of where that where that device is located All right anyway um, something to be aware of it's an issue uh i would hope that google and apple would be uh absolutely um sticklers about requiring uh, a subpoena or a warrant Yeah, it's a it's an interesting story. I don't, there's nothing more to say about it except that uh, this is this is going on. And so when we talk about your data being sold to the Russians and the Chinese, your data is also available in a variety of other ways. Um, let's talk about the transparent laptop. I guess we kind of did. This is one of the many things announced at Mobile World Congress. Uh, look at that. You could see his hand right through the lid of the laptop. Why? I don't know. <laughs> it was i mean this is exactly what you were saying in terms of like I, I had this whole emotional cycle reading the article and watching the video of at first being like this is so cool but then as you read more you're like yeah what what is this for <laughs> um and i think they're like trying to come up with use cases um like the idea of for example if you're trying to trace something on your screen maybe that it's helpful to see what's behind it um, and then as I thought about it more, you realized that, of course, then there's all these cases where you definitely don't want your, you know, screen to be transparent. You know, I work, do a lot of my work in, in a public library, and I don't necessarily want people to be able to read everything that's going on, on my computer. People in an office, if you're watching uh, Twit when you should be working, um, that's not necessarily something you want somebody walking well, by. That's why you should be see. using an Apple Vision Pro. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm then you're safe. I'm working. How about this? The... Uh, the uh, Motorola phone, you can, uh, like, slap on your wrist, and it'll go all the way around. It'll bend all the way around your wrist. Uh, okay. This is from a CNET's yeah, no, article. Andrew Langson, who's on our shows frequently, talking about this. The wearable phone, again, like the Lenovo concept, they're not necessarily going to sell this. Samsung says they're going to sell a new Galaxy Ring. They showed that off, but didn't give us any information about price or availability so coming someday to a samsung user a lot of people uh including andrew saw the humane ai pin at mo in barcelona and said actually it's pretty cool it works better than i thought it would this is the pin it's been delayed that has an ai and it records everything going on it doesn't have a screen you could talk to it uh he said that it does a pretty good job of showing uh, images on your hand, which is actually uh, new information. It beams light onto your hand as a screen. It could translate languages. It could, yeah. Anyway, they were impressed. Also delayed. Will it be allowed in movie theaters? Ha! Ah, interesting. Good way to record a movie, huh? I'm just going to be like well, staring not. daggers at whoever's pin goes off. <laughs> <laughs> your pin went off. Oh, uh, phones are bad enough. Here's the Xiaomi SU7 EV, also at Mobile World Congress. Now, you may say, wait a minute, Xiaomi doesn't make cars. They make phones. Do they make cars, Sam? Apparently they do now. They they have made one car. Um, <laughs> there it is. You know, they, plan, they plan to offer this. So, you know, Huawei has also announced a, an EV that they plan to sell, uh, you know, in 
China, you know, there's a bunch of suppliers that you can get various components from and, and put stuff together, you know, put a, put it all together and build a car. You know, this is not the sort of thing that Apple would want to do, uh, but you can do it and do it fairly cost effectively. Um, you know, and, and this is actually probably, you know, to what I was saying earlier, you know, one of the reasons why Apple, um, you know, decided to finally pull the plug on the, uh, the EV project, because you've got in China, especially you've got so many competitors that are able to offer really impressive products at prices that are way below what Apple would ever even consider selling the car for. Yeah. Do you think some of it is Huawei or, or Xiaomi saying, well, we can do a car, Apple. <laughs> kind of like just well, rubbing their noses in it. You know, one, one thing to keep in mind, you know, there's hundreds of, you know, Chinese brands, automotive brands, um, you know, dozen, certainly dozens of EV only brands. Um, almost none of them are actually turning a profit. Oh, really? So, Is it the yeah, government subsidies that keeps money. them afloat? For now, yeah. yeah. You saw that Josh Hawley uh, wants to charge a, uh, a whopping um, tariff of 27 point, no, 125% on imported Chinese autos. 125% double the price to keep them out of the U.S.? Does it make a yeah. difference? Is this, does the thought that BYD might start bringing its very popular cars into the U.S. a real threat to American auto manufacturers? Um, if they actually did it, yes. It, it would be a serious threat because, you know, they can, you know, they're able to, to build the vehicles at a much lower price point than what we've seen from any of the uh, legacy Western brands. Um, you know, so, you know, a car like the, the BYD Seal, you know, which is, a really excellent car, um, you know, could be sold for probably under $30,000 in the U S right. And, you know, there's nothing in the U S market, you know, that would be competitive with that, you know, at that price point. Um, but you know, right now for, for now, at least companies like BYD and various other, uh, Chinese brands are content to focus on other markets. You can't get Europe. them in the U S now. You can't, you can't get any of them. There are some Chinese built vehicles for sale in the U S uh, but none under Chinese brands. So there's a couple of Volvos, Polestar two, mm. they're built in China, uh, but they're, they're sold here. Um, Buick Envisions built in China, sold here. Um, but uh, right now they're the Chinese automakers are more content to go after some other markets like South America in particular and Southeast Asia and really targeting those markets where there's very little penetration of EVs yet and, you know, hit those markets first um, before they, they try, and, try and take a stab at the U S who was, was some YouTuber I'm trying to remember who it was, bought a, it was basically a Chinese golf cart and had it shipped to him in the U S <laughs> and assembled it. But it's kind of a cute little car. It'd be kind of cool to have it. Um, well, I know Jason Torchinsky, who used to be a Jalopnik uh, and now has a site called uh, The Autopian. Um, he bought, um, what, what was it called? It's like a really cheap Chinese yeah. built. It cost him more to ship it uh, here. About three or four years ago. Yeah. I think he got it through Alibaba, actually. Yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> I think you're right. And it cost him more to ship it than the car itself, which was just a couple of thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. Um it looks kind of cool, though. I thought, you know, hey, if you here it is. Is this it? Is this the? Is this the car? This is Jason's uh, oh, story. No, that's that. Yeah, that's not the one I was thinking of. Yeah. Um, but no, I remember yeah. this uh, this article when he did this. It was crazy. Um, the claim is, of course, that the Chinese subsidize the government subsidizes these manufacturers, so it's they compete unfairly although the chinese could also say the u.s subsidizes u.s manufacturers to the tune of seventy five hundred dollars per car um that's a subsidy right uh yeah, yeah. no it absolutely is yeah so, um yeah it's, it was the the, the, the Chang -Li. Uh, Chang Li freeman yeah yeah somebody yeah dropped it. i just dropped that in the uh, chat thank you yeah let me see if i can find this uh 
<laughs> this picture. The world's cheapest Chinese EV. And Jason said, it's actually really good. Yeah. <laughs> It's got a radio that can play MP3s. Okay. A 1.1 1 .1 horsepower rear rear wheel drive electric motor. 28 miles I love of the range. Look. The, the, and the 20, wheels are the size of a small pizza. Speed. They're not. Yeah. They're not huge. I would take that on the road. I would absolutely. Not take the that highway. The not the highway. But no, uh, no, no, no. Like yeah. yeah. Small town road. Small. Yeah, yeah. but I'm driving around town, I'd love to have that. It looks like a, the front looks like a little dragon. I don't think that's by accident. Yeah. No, no, that's that's on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, Jason has uh, has his parked on the sidewalk out front, so it's really yeah. easy to find his house. <laughs> yeah, J Jason's got a thing for strange cars. <laughs> Top I'm speed, sorry. twenty-three miles an hour, but that's enough for around town. <laughs> yeah, that's enough. Yeah. yeah, you wouldn't take it on the highway, but uh, it's like a golf cart. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think this is. Uh, I want one. It's <laughs> cute. It'd be perfect for uh, getting to the studio. Exactly. That's all I need. You know, it's funny. I have a big old fancy car to drive two miles every day. Probably could just get a Chang Lee instead next time. Yeah, it's got 23 miles of range. It'd be good. It's perfect. And it'd probably be safer than riding the bike across the bridge. Yeah. 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 Uh, all right. Let's take a break and we'll wrap things up with our wonderful panel. Sam and Bull Sam, and always great to have you on. Wheelbearings.media for his podcast. He's a principal researcher at uh, Guidehouse Insights. And he's on our Twitch social server, our Mastodon, s at Samuel Abul Samad. Is that really the whole thing, Sam Abul Samad? That's yeah. your, that's your handle. Okay. Yeah, Sam Abul Samad. S A M A B U E L S A M I D. That's not so hard. Yep. That's, that's like it's that's where you find me anywhere I am. That's, that's the username I use. Nice. Someone else took Sam A, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Sam must take. Oh, I want, I want, I want something that would be distinctive. <laughs> Sam A is, of course, Sam Altman of OpenAI, yeah. and that is Anthony Ha, who is Anthony Ha dot com, and Anthony Ha on the Twitter and the Threads and the Blue Sky, and uh, his pod podcast is original content. When we come back, we'll say goodbye to one of our beloved hosts, but we'll also. Get some content recommendations from uh, Anthony since he is in charge of all of that. Our show today brought to you by Lookout. Today, every company is a data company. You know what that means. Every company is at risk. Cyber threats, breaches, leaks. These are the new norm. And cyber criminals grow more sophisticated by the minute. At a time when boundaries no longer exist, what it means for your data to be secure is fundamentally changed. Enter Lookout. From the first phishing text to the final data grab lookout stops modern breaches as swiftly as they uh, unfold. Whether on a device, in the cloud, across networks, or working remotely at the local coffee shop, Lookout gives you clear visibility into all your data at rest and in motion. You'll monitor, assess, and protect without sacrificing productivity for security. With a single unified cloud platform, Lookout simplifies and strengthens, reimagining security for the world that will be today. Visit Lookout.com today to learn how to safeguard data, secure hybrid work, and reduce IT complexity. That's Lookout.com. We thank him so much for supporting this week in tech. We'll be back with a final word and a farewell to one of our most beloved hosts. But first, let's look back at the week that was this week on Twitter. Jason Snell has breaking Leo, news. It's just in. Yes. I hope you were not planning your financial future around buying an Apple car. What? Previously on Twit, Mac Break Weekly. They have finally thrown in the towel. A lot of alarm bells went off when there were those reports about how they were only going to launch it without a steering wheel and with yeah. complete autonomous driving. And it was one of those moments of like, what What are they, you know, what are they smoking? Time to geek out. It's the Untitled Linux Show. This story has all our favorite topics all bundled into one. The Rust-based terminal called Warp. This week in Google. We should talk about the Gemini. Yeah. I'm going to say Tempest in a Teapot. Woke Gemini. 
just as social media is put in a vice. Take down all the bad stuff. No, that's my bad stuff you took down. The same thing is now happening with AI. And the real problem, I think, is this expectation that guardrails can and should be put in such that the model maker can make sure that nothing bad ever happens. This Week in Space. It's episode 100, and we're going to celebrate with Dr. Alan Cern and find out what it takes to ride in space on Virgin Galactic. It was uh, the best work day ever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, where we're headed is, is to a Star Trek future. It will take centuries to get there. But I really believe that when people look back from that far away century, they'll look back to the 2020s and say, that's where Star Trek began. That's where the inflection point when it all started to happen. Twit. It's not your father's twit. It was a great week. Really fun week on Twit. And we thank so thanks to all of our hosts who are so wonderful. Thanks to our club members who support it. And you know what? Congratulations to our club show, Untitled Linux Show, which is now out in public. We've taken all of those shows that have been behind the paywall and put them out in audio. So you can subscribe to that at twit.tv slash ULS. Uh, I am sad to uh, report that one of our dearest, uh, most beloved hosts has passed away. Every single show since 2006, you've seen me use this microphone. This is a Heil PR40. It's a microphone I discovered in 2006 when Bob Heil offered it as a, a, pri a prize for the best podcast award. We won the award. I used the mic and I went, wow, I'm never using another mic again. Bob, a great legendary, not just microphone builder, but sound man, passed away this week at the age of 83. He was the host of our Ham Nation show for 10 years. A ham, uh, Elmer, as they call him, a, a guy who uh, taught and helped young art, uh, amateur radio enthusiasts get their license and, and get into the, uh, the hobby. But he was also an organist. Famous for his uh, his accomplishment, he was the at the age of fifteen, the theater organist at the fabulous Fox Theater in St. Louis, a protege of Stan Can, the great organist. And uh, Bob says and we had a great triangulation, which I'll recommend uh, you listen to. Bob says that in the process of learning how to play that organ and how to tune those hundreds, actually it was literally thousands of pipes in the Great Wurlitzer, he learned how to listen carefully. And that helped him become a sound guy. He opened Ye Old Music Shop, a successful professional music shop in Marissa, Illinois. Eventually, that turned into Heil Sound. It was when he was running the music shop in 1970 that the Grateful Dead came to town. They were playing St. Louis to play the Fabulous Fox in February 1970. They didn't have a sound system. They, they went to Ye Old Music Shop and Bob provided his own sound system for the dead. It was such a success, they asked Bob and his sound system to join them on the tour. That led Bob to designing sound for rock and roll. He toured with The Who on their Who's Next tour. He designed the quadraphonic sound for their Quadrophenia tour. And very famously, he designed the talk box for Peter Frampton. Now, some of you are way too young to remember the 1976 number one album, Frampton Comes Alive. But I played that on repeat for the entire year. And the, one of the things that made that such a unique album was the talk box. He's able to play his guitar and somehow make his mouth and make the guitar talk by moving his mouth. Well, Bob told the story on a triangulation. Peter Frampton's wife came to Bob and said, I need a perfect gift for Peter for his for his birthday. And Bob said, okay, let me design something. He designed a little amplifier that would attach to the guitar and then to a hollow tube that Frampton could put in his mouth, play the guitar. The guitar sound would be piped up through the hollow tube into his mouth, which he could then use to shape the sound, which would then go out into the microphone. It was such a unique sound. It made it made that a hit album, made Frampton a superstar. Joe Walsh used it on his Eagles uh, music. In fact, uh, I remember when we interviewed Joe Walsh uh, on, on Ham Nation. It was a great, a great moment for me to get to talk to the Eagles, the Eagles, uh, lead uh, guitarist he, he uh, said this is the this is this is the, my favorite thing to play and and bob said yeah and no one ever played it better than joe walsh uh his uh, original talk box is now in the rock and roll hall of fame in cleveland ohio 
In fact, Heil Sound is the only manufacturer featured in the display at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, he wrote, he created the first modular mixing console, the Mavis, his custom quadraphonic mixer that he did for the Who and the first Heil Talk Box, all at the Cleveland Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He became an amateur radio operator when he was 13. He was a young guy uh, and has been a ham ever since. But he was, you know, later in life bemoaning the quality of ham microphones. They were universally awful. So he designed his own ham microphone and got into the microphone business and got him into making what we consider the best, you know, large coil dynamic microphone in the business and one we've used ever since and love so much. Uh, a great ham, a great Elmer, a great sound designer, a legend. Uh, he's survived by his beautiful wife, Sarah, who is a wonderful person and his uh, children. Uh, in lieu of flowers, they're asking, and we'll put a link to the uh, the uh, obituary at the Chorus Funeral Home uh, where Bob is in, right now and being held for services. In lieu of flowers, memorial contributions can be made to the Shriners Children's St. Louis or the American Radio Relay League Education and Technology Fund benefiting ARL's uh, education initiatives in school. He was a legend in his pur purple jacket. He came to our studios many times. We loved Bob Heil. Uh, we knew he wasn't doing very well. He, he got cancer about a year ago and it, it was been a long uh, battle, but... Uh, he finally succumbed earlier this week at the age of 83. Bob, we love you. We miss you. And I know the heavenly choir is going to sound a hell of a lot better when Bob Heil gets there. A silent key, Bob Heil. Um, and, of course, he'd had his ham um, call sign since he was 13, which is kind of cool. K9EID. Uh, so there's a silent key for K9EID. Um I got the PR40 you sent me right here. Yeah, it's a great microphone. Still sound. Yeah. Oh. Uh we we loved Bob and he he was an amazing guy. So I hate to end on a sad note, but uh, but he deserves the uh the attention and the accolade. We have so many uh, amazing stories about Bob. Uh what a great guy. What a great guy. Um thank you so much Anthony Ha and uh Sam Abul Samad. Anthony, give us some great original content. He's the host of the Original Content Podcast. Oh, sure. What's uh, coming up say, that you'd exci you're excited about? Oh, that coming up. Well, I would say that if you're just looking for something to watch right now, yes. that's really fun. Always. Um, I would something that we, was on Max for a couple of years, but just made its way to Netflix is Warrior. It's a, oh. a martial arts show set in. Uh, the 19th century San Francisco, but like kind of a very heightened, f almost fantasy version. I think very, very loosely based on some ideas that Bruce Lee had for, I think, what was eventually became Kung Fu. Um, and it is just, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's definitely pulpy. It's trashy. It's the kind of cable, you know, Cinemax original show where in the first episode, you'll see a lot of nudity, a lot of like, all right, I see what kind of show this is, but... It'll, you'll have they a really good do, time with it. It's so funny because they always do that in the first episode. Everyone just <laughs> like this is, oh, well, we know you won't watch this show unless we give you some. So here and then that's it. Right. Then it's over. Right. And you can exactly. move on with your life. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> it's how little what they I'm, think of us is what it really is. That's, yeah. that's how I interpret that. And arguably, you know, some sometimes they are proven correct. So maybe uh, yeah. uh, we're good. I'll put this on my list. And I'm, I'm excited about The Three-Body Problem, which is coming to Netflix. <gasps> and if you haven't already, I highly recommend reading the books yes, before it comes out. I agree. Uh, that I'm always a fan of reading uh, sci-fi books before the movie because it's one or the other is going to imprint on you and how it looks, how it feels, how it sounds. And the book is such a brilliant... It, actually, the books, there's three of them, is so brilliant um, that it's worth reading them first. It's a little, I, I found it a little difficult because it's translated from Chinese and the translation mm -hmm. I think isn't very elegant. Maybe that's how the book was written. Uh, but the, but the thoughts, the story, the ideas, the people in it are really great. I can't wait to see it. Have you, you haven't seen a preview of it? I, I've seen the trailers. That's Just all. The nothing. Trailers. Yeah, nothing that too, hasn't yeah. been available to yeah. the public. Have you seen Dune 2 yet? No, I, I'm so angry about this. I have a friend of mine who's out of town this weekend and we agreed to go together. So I'm going on Thursday and I am 
absolutely furious with him. Have you seen <laughs> Dune 2 yet? No, and I can't wait. It is in the it is in the theaters now. I haven't been to a movie theater since COVID, since March 17th, 2020, oh, okay. since COVID. Uh, and actually once, I'm sorry, once John Slinina, our studio manager, rented an entire movie theater just for us so it was safe to go. What did we see? I forget, John. Dr. Strange. Sorry? Dr. Strange. Dr. Strange. Yeah, that was pretty good. Oh, That cool. was pretty good. But I think I might wait to see Dune until it comes out. Uh, Didn't you see Oppenheimer in the theater? I Oh, you're right. See, Sam, you know more about me than I do. <laughs> that, that's right. I forgot. But that was IMAX. That isn't, does that count really? I mean, yeah. that's a, a more an amusement park than a Well, Dune 2 is you also went somewhere IMAX? outside your house. <laughs> Dune 2 is IMAX too. That's right. Yeah. Uh, is it native IMAX or is it uh, adapted to the IMAX? I think it, I think it's native. Oh. I don't know how how much of it, but some of it, I think. I, I would be willing to see it that way. I thought Dune 1 was amazing. And I'm a fan of the book. That's a good, another good example of a book you should read first. But this one's pretty Absolutely. true to the book, unlike uh, Foundation. Well, I guess Foundation was true to the book, but just not good. All right. There's some good things to watch for. Sam, You got what are you watching these days besides Shogun? Uh, oh, uh, we just started last night. We watched the first episode of uh, the completely made-up adventures of Dick Turpin. I can't wait to uh, see that. I've downloaded uh, that, that for our trip to Mexico. Was, was, Is it good? It was really funny. Yeah, it's very funny. <laughs> uh, he uh, was in and, uh, uh, the IT crowd, and I yeah, yeah I'm I really want to see this. Good. And also, um, that's an Apple TV sexy, unique. Yes. Yeah, and uh, Sexy Beast. Oh. Um, if you, uh, if you remember the, the movie from 2000, yeah. um, this series is a prequel. So it shows you the origins of Gal and, and, uh, Don Logan. Um, and, uh, you see the, the, you know, Don Logan is the character that Ben Kingsley played in the movie in 2000. And you, here you see the origin story of how, how they got to where, where they were at that, you know, in the movie. And it's really, really good. It was a great uh, movie. You probably should see the movie first. Uh, no, maybe not. Not necessarily. Okay. I mean, you could you could watch this first. Um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith on Amazon is also really good. Yeah. See, I didn't uh, like the movie, but yeah. the but the TV show is, is good, huh? Don, Donald, yeah, Donald Glover and different. Maya Erskine. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's it's quite fun to watch. Um, and something that is actually finished now but if you haven't watched it i highly recommend you watch reservoir Do or no reservation, reservation. dogs ah yeah. um it's on it's on hulu on fx um it's a fantastic show um about a group of uh teenage uh native americans uh that live on a reservation in in oklahoma um, and it's just, it's a, Oh, beautiful it's Taika story. Waititi. I love his stuff. He, he, he's, he's the executive producer, but, oh, okay. um, yeah, Sterling Harjo, uh, is really the creator yeah. of this. And he, he wrote it. I think he wrote almost all of it. Um, and it's, it's really wonderful and it's definitely worth watching. There's love four it. seasons of it and it's, it's fantastic. Sterling nice. Harjo is the director of Atlanta. Atlanta. So it has that same sort of vibe. Okay. Oh, Okay, yeah, I think he did. Yeah, he did some of the. Uh, he directed some of the episodes uh, of Atlanta. There were a bunch of different directors on that, but yeah. So, to absolutely, if you haven't watched Reservation Dogs, watch that. Wow, now I got a lot of TV to go home and watch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Samable Samad. Love you, our car guy. He appears regularly on Ask the Tech Guys and our other shows. You can also listen to him on his own show, Wheelbearings.media, the Wheelbearings podcast. And, of course, principal researcher at Guidehouse Insights, which probably keeps you pretty busy during the day. Uh, no, it certainly does. Real pleasure to have you all the way from Ypsilanti, Michigan. Thank you, Sam. Always fun to be on the show with you, Leo. Anthony, I loved yeah, having you on. Pleasure to meet you, Anthony. We'll have you on soon again. He's the co-host of the Original Content Podcast. Freelance writer. You'll read his stuff all over. Uh, you're writing all the time. I guess once you get in the habit, it's hard to stop. What's the point of living otherwise? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. People aren't reading your words. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's so great to have you, Anthony. Thank you for being here. Uh, thanks to all of you for watching. We appreciate it. The show uh, This <clears throat> Week in Tech is our kind of flagship show. It's That's why we call it the <clears throat> Twit Network. 
every Sunday, 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern, uh, Pacific Time. That's 5 to 8 p.m. Eastern, 2200 UTC. Uh, we stream it live, as we do with all of our shows, while in taping. So you can watch us, you know, behind the scenes do the show on YouTube at youtube.com slash twit. But most people watch after the fact, because it is, after all, a podcast. Audio or video available at the website, twit.tv. You can also uh, watch it on YouTube. There's a video uh, of each show on the YouTube channel dedicated to Twit. Best thing to do, though, if you would ask me, is to subscribe in your favorite podcast player. That way you'll get it and you'll have it and you'll be ready for your Monday morning commute. Armed with this week in tech. A very special shout out to our Club Twit members who always make this, as always, make this show possible. Twit.tv slash Club Twit if you're not a member yet. Thanks in advance. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next time. Another twit is in the can. Bye-bye.